Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Southern California Primate Research Forum. Um, we are so excited to have everyone. Um, yeah, um, we are, uh, this is sponsored by the uh, Association for Primate Evolutionary Studies at California State University, Fullerton. Um, I'm Eric, I'm the president of the club. Uh, Dr. Comitante is our faculty advisor. Um, really excited to have this forum. Last year we were not able to have it, um, obviously because of our current circumstances, but um, we're excited to be back this year um, and to be focusing on the apes. Um, so yeah. <laughs> You can introduce our speakers too. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so from the Given Conservation Center, we have Gabby um, Scolar. Um, from the Diane Fossey um, Gorilla Fund, we have Dr. Robin Morrison. Um, from North Carolina State University, uh, we have Dr. Kara Walker and Dr. Christopher Walker. And then also from Cal State Fullerton we, and the Orangutan Conservancy, we have Dr. Rafael Comitante. Okay, great. That was lovely. Very nicely. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric, for saving my voice a little bit. Um, so uh, we'll get started. <clears throat> so I'm losing my voice, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I will get started soon, but I just wanted to mention that um, the way we'll run it is that the speaker will present, uh, um, and then afterwards we'll do a quick Q&A between each speaker. So um, we'll, pro if We'll try to use the hand raise thing that's in the system, uh, or uh, when the speaker finishes, you can just sing out and say, I have a question. Or you could also put it into the chat function and write it down, and then we'll be monitoring that so that this way we can uh, an answer in multiple ways, multiple questions that people may have uh, after, uh, after each speaker uh, speaks. Okay, so does anybody have any questions before we get started? Sing out, Louise. That's from Gypsy. Okay, never mind. Okay. <laughs> Gypsy. Okay, so uh, hopefully we don't have any uh, issues. Okay. Um, all right, then, Gabby, take us away. All right. So I, this is my first Zoom lecture. <laughs> and I have to figure out the share. Uh, Okay, but so I'm just gonna click on it and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, click on it. And then when you click on it, it's going to give you options on your personal screen to okay. on your presentation. Yes, okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> the learning process, don't worry. Yeah. You only have 400 people waiting, it's okay. Yes. <laughs> So do you see the greed screen share at the bottom? Yes, it's not sharing yet? No, oh. you have to click on the screen share and yeah. then it's gonna tell you, uh, you're gonna <laughs> presentation and then click share screen. There you go, you got it. Okay. And then... I think it's happening. Yes, we can see it. Okay. And yeah, then... Gabby, we can see it. All right, so uh, my name is Gabriela Scholler and um, I'm the director of the Gibbon Center. But I wanted to talk a little bit about how just this whole thing started. Um, as a child, I was just fascinated with animals and um, I spend a lot of time in the nature and in our garden and I was just studying ants and everything. And um, when I uh, finished high school, I went to study biology and I started uh, working with this gibbon. His name is Kossat. Um, he was a Northern white chick gibbon. And I started going to the zoo and I was recording his uh, vocalizations. And um, I sent my recordings to a professor um, in Budapest, Dr. Uh, Maria Uihai, who's studying Gibbons uh, self-recognition. And uh, she was actually a philosophist and um, she knew about the Gibbons Center here in the US. And uh, she was just 
just very interested in gibbons. So uh, we started working to, together, studying gibbon cognition in different zoos. And here we were in a just a small zoo, working with a white-handed gibbon, uh, hiding food under low uh, um, plastic containers. And what was interesting with this gibbon that uh, she would kind of find the food and solve the problem, but she didn't want to eat it. All she wanted the attention and the touching. So while I was studying cognition, I was also become very interested in um, Gibbon's welfare and their husbandry. And, and this just strengthened to, to uh, continue learning. And um, after I graduated in Hungary, I came to the US at the Gibbon Conservation Center. Uh, in Santa Clarita. And I worked with the founder, Ellen Mutnik, for uh, over, over seven years. So Ellen started the center um, in uh, 1976, and he was just a very passionate, very dedicated person. And um, working with him was just very inspiring. And we often work for, from sunrise to sunset. and. Um, at the same time working with Alan, I also had the opportunity to attend uh, conferences, to give talks at the center. She introduced to other primatologists and all these things like re-inspired me to uh, stay in this field and study Gibbons. And um, after his passing in 2011 to care, continue the Gibbons Center. So uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We participate in captive breeding programs, uh, non-invasive studies. We have students coming from all over the world uh, to work with Gibbons, to intern here, uh, volunteer here, and to uh, doing non-invasive studies. And um, we also uh, have some rare species like the Northern White Chick Gibbon that we are participate in a species survival plan. And then we work with other species like Javan, Pileated Gibbons and participate in global uh, breeding programs. And uh, we have 37 Gibbons um, and um, which give a great opportunity to actually com do comparative studies on the different species. And, uh, but why, just why study Gibbons? Um, for me, it was uh, mainly the vocalization, but there's so many fascinating things in Gibbons. Um, they were the first apes that evolved sometimes around uh, 17 million years ago. And we still share 96% uh, of our DNA with Gibbons. So um, that's already a, um, just the, interesting things to study them, but they are also interesting in their own right. Um, they are endangered, they need protection, and uh, they're very similar to us. Um, they live in family groups. Um, we share many, um, um, we share many, very many similar behaviors, um, pattern alter, upright post or bipedal walking, uh, singing, duetting. So all those things were just very interesting for me. Here we have a Eastern Hulu given, just uh, holding an iPhone. And interacting with it. So uh, by giving them different enrichment, we can also continue learning about them. Scrolling. <laughs> It just shows that they just very similar. They also enjoy Instagram. <laughs> but <laughs> besides that, so uh, upright posture and um, the, the their unique way of locomotion, the brachiating, uh, they are fascinating animals just to watch, uh, whether they are um, in a zoo or in the wild. 
uh, here you can see a slow motion of them uh, walking upright. This is also a northern white tea gibbon. Moving through ropes. Uh, this is show the swinging, uh, prohibiting through branches. Mm. Here, a pileated gibbon, prohibiting. So they are the greatest acrobats. Their diet is mainly contains fruits, uh, young leaves, insects. Sometimes they catch birds and if they find the nest, they also eat the eggs. Um, in the, at the given center, we try to give them different rows, tree leaves and um, many different fruits and vegetables. Their gestation period is six and a half months and they usually have single births. Uh, the infants nurse until two, two and a half years of age. And uh, their reproduction uh, starts when they are around eight or 10 years old. And this is the age when they also are uh, gonna leave the, the family group. Uh, the, the newborn infant is very, very tiny and almost hairless. So here you just see uh, just the little foot sticking out from the mother's fur. Uh, here is also a newborn infant, uh, filiated given, a uh, couple months old. They already have the blonde fur and they, at around three months old, they start um, become a little bit more independent and start climbing off the mother. Around six months old, filiated given with the mother. And um, here you can see the mother and the infant and the older sibling. So they live in family groups with the uh, parents and the dependent offspring. The group can be uh, have two, three offspring, sometimes even more. Together, they protect their territory. And uh, Gibbons also known that they are serial monogamous. So they tend to have one partner at a time. Um, so usually you only see one adult male and one adult female in a group, but there are always uh, exceptions. And we know that their social system is more flexible than we thought in the past. <laughs> and this is just a fun cartoon. Um, the Gibbons do steal their partner's food and the adult female tend to be more dominant than the male. And this is just a, a sweet uh, widow of a family. Uh, that's the female and the infant just sharing some food. The other interesting you see, uh, many species of gibbons born blonde and as they're getting older, they change color and they slowly turn black. So uh, here the Northern white chick gibbons are orange, the infant bore the same color and here the see the uh, almost six months old offspring is starting to turn darker. And the father is black with the white cheeks and the family and nuclear family spend a lot of time together. Uh, both the mother and the father participate raising the offspring, they share food. Uh, the father will interact and play with the offspring. The mother is the one who usually carry the infant. They breastfeed the first three months and um, then they start eating solid food, but continue nursing until they two, two and a half. And at around six months old, they're getting pretty good at moving around in their enclosure or in the habitat. And um, 
once they are around two, they can uh, swing pretty much as well as their parents. And in this species, the northern white she given. So this little infant is a female. Once she's, once she's around six, six, six and a half years old, she's gonna go through a second color change. And from black, she's gonna turn back to orange. And the young males will stay black. She's just grooming her mother. So here uh, you see, uh, here we have uh, the fathers. So we have uh, examples of the adult male would pull the offspring. The, here you can see the Javan given, but uh, in any species, they are very active um, interacting and sharing food with their offspring. And um, as the offspring growing older, they will also start interacting with their younger siblings. And uh, sometimes they're also known to care, uh, uh, holding them and carrying them. And they spend their time playing, uh, wrestling with each other, chasing, grooming each other. But the main reason I, I stayed in this field and uh, my main interest is their vocalizations. Gibbons uh, make many different sounds. And uh, besides their well-known song uh, to mark their territory, they also make other uh, vocalizations, uh, contact calls, alarm calls. Um, so they are also, can you hear the sound if I'm playing it? Yes. Okay. So this is the territorial call that's happening here every morning. And what's interesting uh, here is a unique uh, place because we have many different species together and 37 individuals that would never be in a wild so close to each other. So if one given starts singing, everybody, almost everybody joins in, but there are leaders. So we have specific individuals who will start the song and then other ones will join in. And uh, there are also certain species will start and other ones that are more quiet will join in later. So um, it's just an interesting community also to study. And then this is a different sound. Here you heard uh, an infant siamang crying and then the answer from the mother. So these very intimate vocalizations, it's very quiet. So you have to record it very closely. Um, and you, you can only hear it usually in the first months after a birth when the infant vocalizes more and the mother might be a little bit unexperienced. So, um, Again, it's just a very unique thing that we can record here at the center um, easier than will be um, in the wild. And then what you hear here is um, was an alarm call uh, 
different species of gibbons have different alarm calls, uh, but they also have specific alarms for something that uh, they see on the ground or, or a bird that's flying over. Or uh, certain species also have a third alarm when they are just getting a little bit upset, they're not really sure what's going on. They might give that alarm call when another species of gibbon making an alarm, but they cannot see the source of the uh, what's happening. And then uh, this video is interesting of the way they make some of their calls. Certain species can make calls by breathing in and breathing out. So some just a unique thing. And So that was the territorial song of the pileated gibbon, and not just the song, it was a duet uh, between the married pair. So it started with a female great call, and then the male kind of in the middle of the female call joined in and uh, finished the song. And they practiced this uh, several times during the day, starting at around sunrise and a few more times during the day. And um, What's also interesting and uh, what's part of my study here is uh, how they develop the duet. So when you introduce two gibbons or sometimes even before they can see each other, they start calling back and forth um, and then you move them closer, you put them in the same enclosure and then eventually they start a duet. But we know that a newly introduced pair doesn't sing a very well coordinated song um, and then once they've been together for a couple months, after they bonded with each other, they started to pay more attention to each other and start singing a more coordinated duet. So I'm, this is something I, um, after introducing two gibbons, I tried to collect uh, recordings and study how they uh, start coordinating better with each other. Uh, but besides the vocalizations, their facial expression also very interesting. Uh, here you can see uh, a grimace, it was a nervous smile. We were introducing the father and it was during feeding times of a young uh, a juvenile uh, male making a grimace. Uh, this is a play face, uh, they were playing with each other. This is also a play face from the adult male who just uh, received a new swing. Uh, this is just a yawn, but they also have their big open mass threat when they are aggressive towards another. Um, and then just in general about gibbons, uh, their taxonomy is constantly changing, but uh, today uh, most people agree that there's 20 species recognized for genera. The four genera have different chromosome numbers and uh, we are lucky here at the center to have species from all four genera. The different uh, genera have um, uh, bigger differences in their vocalization. Um, and the sea among is the largest of all the gibbons, um, but it's just one genus, uh, the Symphalangus, uh, larger uh, than all the other uh, smaller gibbon species. They find in Southeast Asia, Northeast India, South, Southern China, in 10 rich countries, they protect within each of these countries, but unfortunately, all species are declining. And uh, the main reason of their uh, being endangered is uh, deforestations, uh, large areas of forest getting cut down for palm oil plantations and agri other agriculture, um, other plantations for uh, paper products, for hardwood, for mining. Um, climate change also affecting uh, the forest. Um, certain populations like the Hainan gibbon, uh, the rare, one of the rarest primates is around 30 individuals left. Once the population is so small, um, 
there are other issues that are in breeding and the disease could uh, kill a large number of gibbons. And, uh, and the wildlife trade, uh, hunting for meat, uh, for trophies, for collections, uh, for ceremonies and for the, um, for the pets. Uh, they're taking these young gibbons away from their parents, killing their parents and selling them as a pet, using them in touristy areas as an attraction. And unfortunately, probably during the pandemic, there was not as much traveling, uh, but before you could go through social media sites and find these pictures that people were taking pictures with the uh, young primates, gibbons, and, but also other wildlife. And um, we were trying to report them uh, to other organizations to try to rescue these animals. Um, we are just a small organization. We mainly do access to conservation. We're educating the people here at the center but um, there's many other organizations in the field that we work with and uh, share knowledge. We visited these centers. Um, and uh, these organizations are working in the field, are working with the local people, educating people about gibbons, uh, planting trees, um, doing surveys, trying to protect the forest, rescuing gibbons from the wildlife trade. And, um, I was very inspired going with them to different schools and um, meeting these kids that they were just in love with Gibbons and they, um, they were really opened their eyes uh, to protect their wildlife. So it was, uh, I was in Java, uh, visited two conservation centers, uh, the Javan Primate Center and the, the Javan Conservation Center. And I also visited their uh, rehabilitation site. They built the giant uh, open air enclosures uh, for the gibbons uh, before the release where they can start bonding with each other and then they get moved to the release site. Um, here is a Javan gibbon at the sanctuary with a young infant. Uh, this was in Northeast India, another sanctuary that they are also doing rehabilitation and release. And they were doing running their own school for the local uh, kids. Uh, but you can also have gibbons um, when you buy your groceries, uh, look into where the product came from, how it was produced, look at the ingredients, farm oil, I'm sure other speakers will talk about it. Um, limit what you buy and uh, limit new purchases, reuse and recycle, just in general try to reduce your footprint. And of course, once we can go and travel again, uh, don't take pictures with the wildlife. And um, if you have time, volunteer, either uh, at another organization or, or at our place, um, you can help with many different things. Um, it's a lot of fun to run our conservation station and educate people about Gibbons, uh, help with enrichment. Um, it's uh, a lot of fun to create these uh, fun items for the Gibbons and fill it out. <laughs> you can camp. Uh, we're gonna very soon have a new site with more space and uh, you can definitely come and uh, be on site uh, do your own research project, help volunteer, uh, help us build enclosures, uh, put in branches. So we have a lot of volunteers spend um, time here. Uh, many volunteers started their career in primates at the Gibbon Center. So it's a, uh, it's hard work, but it's, it's worth it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, are there any questions? Sing out or put them in chat or something. Hi, uh, this is Gary. I have a question for Gabby. Um, How do I get out of the screen share? Stop share. It says stop. stop. Share. Okay. Okay. No, that did not. Could I ask a question? Yes. Uh, what's the latest plans for your relocating uh, to another place? So um, we are in escrow for a property in uh, Santa Margarita. 
and uh, we have the money for the down payment and we were approved for the loan. So uh, on April 13, I think it's going to go through and we will have the key. That's super exciting. And uh, we have until July um, to move the Gibbons. So as soon as we own the land, uh, we already started the process for the permits. We have to get a conditional use permit at the new site. We're gonna start moving. And uh, that will take a couple of months. So hopefully we'll finish by July, but um, working on it. Good luck to you. Thank you. I hope many people support your organization to help you with this move. Thank you. We, we receive so much community support. I, I can't express with words how much I appreciate people helping us during this last year, seriously. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from anybody? Well, I have one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that, uh, that um, that sometimes the given uh, pair will have multiple offspring, not just one or two, but sometimes more. Is that something you see uh, in your setting or is that also in the wild where they'll have multiple offspring with them, more than two? Uh, not sure about the wild, um, but at the center, uh, we had enclosures that we had, uh, I think three at one time, four offspring still living peacefully with the parents. So, uh, but I think in the wild, I, th I think they can have up to three. Uh, the difference in a wild that they have a bigger gap between offspring. So in captivity, they can have a new offspring every two years. So they most more likely to have a bigger family than in a wild if they have like three, four years between two offspring. Because in the wild, by the time they are 10 years old, sometimes eight, uh, they get pushed out of the territory. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, any anyone else? Let me check the chat. If there's anything in there? Okay. All right. So, oh, all right. So, Wendy had a question: Where you'd be moving to? But that was answered. Yeah. Right, to Santa Margarita, you said. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's in San Luis Obispo County. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty area. So are you already building cages and things? Are you uh, enclosures? Are you, or is that already happening? No, so we have to get the permit. So, but we have an enclosure that we are building here. Uh, it's just a new set of enclosure. And that will be the first one that we transfer at the new site. Cause mm. it will make it easier that we have an empty enclosure to put a, a group in there. And then we can take that another enclosure here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also repairing the enclosure, so we will not have to do it during the move. So if there is any panels that are not need to be replaced, we try to do that now. Mm. And how are you going to physically move the gibbons? How are we going to move the gibbons? Uh, so um, we're gonna we we're gonna do a medical checkup on each gibbon. It's a great time to do that since we yeah. don't have to capture them anyway. Uh, we have gibbons that are, um, can be hand injected. We have a few that we're doing some training to make it easier to capture. Um, if none of the way, sometimes they get in a crate, uh, we will have a few gibbons that will have to blow dart uh, to be able to capture. And then we do a checkup. They will be in a crate. Uh, we'll probably travel them overnight and then uh, they will wake up at a new place. Okay, but so, but when you say travel over, you're going to put them in a, in a van? A, a... Yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, even in, with our Jeep, uh, we can put two Gibbons and in another car, we put one. Uh, we are thinking to get a van to, so we can transfer a whole family in a crate uh, in the same car, yeah. How many Gibbons do you have? We have 37. Okay. Be like a and it's 16 enclosures plus the complete new set. <laughs> right, right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But well, the well, new well, site well. is uh, 25 acres. This mm -hmm. is five acre here. We can wow. really expand and build much bigger enclosures. So that will be great site. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well done. That's really, that must have been quite a challenge. Yes, everybody, really. I mean, that must have been quite a challenge to get. To get 
you've been planning this for several years now. So it's nice to see it finally come. It's finally coming together. Uh, and, and I know there are people that are like not really believing it, but uh, we had to believe in it that we can do it. So we just kept pushing. And I also want to say that it's only three of us. So it's three staff. So today, because I'm here, uh, Alma leading the uh, public tours outside, and Jesse, who do all the wedding and construction, are trained to go feed. <laughs> well, well, we thank you very much for taking time out of your business. Thank you. That was amazing. Good luck with the move. I, it's amazing. I, I can't wait till it's done and then we can all come up and look at it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there. Okay, great. Let me just check to make sure. Applause, applause. Okay. Alan would be smiling. One of the <laughs> participants said, and he certainly would. You really honored him greatly by, by keeping the, first of all, by keeping the, the center together mm -hmm. and then by continuing there and to make this mammoth move. It's just amazing. So well done you. Okay, uh, so, uh, all right, so uh, thank you again. Oh, hi, Anne. <laughs> I'm sorry, I get distracted easily, as you can see. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'm next then, I guess. All right, well, let me share my screen. Uh, there we go. Okay, let me just get it up here. Okay, can uh, everybody see that? Yes, hopefully. Okay, great. Okay, so there I am. <laughs> All right, so for, for my presentation, basically what I wanted to uh, sort of outline and focus on is the new species of orangutan that's been newly named. It's not a new species because they knew those orangutans were there uh, where they are, and I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but uh, they thought it was part of the... Um, of the Sumatran orangutan uh, uh, Pongo abelii group. And uh, when they did some genetic testing roughly about 10 years ago or so, they realized that it was, uh, it was definitely a different species. So, um, but, I, but we can't really talk about Tapanuliensis, the newly named orangutan, without getting an understanding of, of the evolution of orangutan. So that's what I'm going to be discussing, going from orangutan to orangutan. And uh, as I call it, it's a tale of multiple species. And this is uh, unique because the orangutan is really the only great ape with a known fossil record. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the orangutan um, uh, is more of a migratory species in a sense. Whereas with, when we look at the African great apes, they pretty much have stayed within the same basic uh, general area of sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And so uh, they did not migrate too far outside of their range area. There's been some movement, of course, because that's how we got uh, gibbons and bonobos, but, but, uh, but generally there, there's not a lot of movement there. But when we look at the orangutan, we see a lot more movement uh, from about uh, 15 uh, million years ago when they kind of diverged from the, um, the, uh, the small ape species. So as uh, Gabriella had that beautiful graphic up, you, if you remember that, uh, uh, looking at the uh, spread of great apes, um, the gibbon group kind of went off on their own trajectory first. And then the orangutan group roughly between 12 and 15 million years ago went off on their trajectory and then eventually the gorilla and then the chimp and the bonobo and then onto the, the trajectory that will eventually lead to, that eventually led to uh, humans. But when we look at the uh, orangutan, we have a tracking, uh, we can track their uh, ancestry from Turkey all the way through to eventually Southeast Asia. So we see their, um, their own particular pathway much more clearly. Just move that small. Okay, so some possible ancestors of the uh, orangutans are um, a Lufengopithecus, which dates to roughly, again, that kind of, of 15 million year or so mark up until um, about eight or so million years ago. And most of these uh, individuals that we're, that I'm going to be showing you just little snippets of. It's just to give you a sense 
of 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 evolutionary where they uh, where they originated from, um, very in a very similar time frame. So here's the finger pithecus, and again, if you know uh, what they have are just some skull pieces, but they're you know they they do have very uh, many similarities to uh, modern uh, orangutan skulls. There's Shivapithecus. Uh, this is Shivapithecus uh, uh, fossil next to an orangutan uh, skull, and again similar time frame within that uh, 15 million or so to about 8 million or so ago. And you can see um, uh, this is just an artist rendition. We don't know what they really looked like uh, in terms of coloring, uh, but by just by looking at their facial structure, they always tend to draw them looking more like orangutans. This is Oranopithecus. Um, again, this is let me just move this. This is uh, Oranopithecus skull right here, um, uh, looking with uh, a modern orangutan skull next to it. This is Oranopithecus right here. Again, similar time frame, right? Another one is Cor uh, Coropithecus uh, perii. Um, this again, same time frame, uh, mostly bone fragments. So we don't have a, a lot of uh, bone evidence, but some, some teeth fragments and things that also put them in the uh, same framework uh, as uh, uh, modern day orangutans in terms of, especially when they look at the teeth. Okay, now um, this leads us to uh, Gigantopithecus and Gigantopithecus is the largest uh, uh, primate that, uh, that, has, uh, that we've been able to track and have evidence of. And um, it is also considered by some to be the ancestor of, uh, of the modern day orangutan. Others feel that they, were, they coexisted with an orangutan-like individual. Uh, and then, as I said, some feel that they were, um, they eventually uh, morphed into. It could be a little bit of both as well, that there was a smaller individual and a larger individual. They may have mated um, and, and created an in-between size individual, um, or they could have just downsized themselves. Um, as resources tend to run out in an area, uh, sometimes it is more advantageous to be smaller than it is to be uh, larger. So we don't know the intricacies of, 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 uh, of the disappearance of um, Gigantopithecus. Uh, I would assume it's resource-based. That makes this the most sense. Okay, uh, so here's um, the uh, skull of a Gigantopithecus. Even with Gigantopithecus, all we really have are fragments, fragments of jaws, lots of teeth. Uh, and, you know, and so taking what uh, a piece of a jaw that we have, they can extrapolate off of that and see what that bone may have been attached to. And because those lower jaw bones that we're able to find in the teeth that we're able to find were so massive, um, it led to them the idea that this was a really large primate up to, you know, uh, nine feet tall, maybe even 10 feet tall. So they were quite large. But again, because of the structure of their teeth uh, and their jaw, when they are drawn, they're, they're drawn to look more like uh, an orangutan. So uh, these are uh, uh, drawings that have been done uh, on what they think Oranopithecus may have looked like. Were they able to go in the trees? I think yes, uh, even though they were quite large, if you had a pretty good substantial sized tree, they probably would climb in the trees as well. They, we tend to think they were more riverine um, uh, individuals living near river systems and, and uh, eating uh, a lot of that fibrous, but highly um, um, has a high water content in the plant systems that are along uh, river systems, also bamboo, things like that. Uh, and that's, that's um, reflected in their teeth because the molars were massive. So they were breaking down really fibrous material. Okay, when we go into the more um, modern Pongo line lineage, uh, we're dealing mostly with the Pleistocene, which is roughly about 3 million years ago to about 10 um, uh, or 11 million years, um, thousand years ago, sorry, uh, where we start to see uh, individuals within that time frame that are, uh, you know, clearly in the Pongo lineage. Okay. All right, so what we've seen so far um, uh, in terms of the, these early pongos that we see in multiple regions, 
We see uh, lots have been found in southern China. Uh, this mimics where we find a lot of Gyanopithecus uh, uh, material as well. So we have 77 different uh, finds within China, 15 in Vietnam, six in Laos, two in Cambodia, four in Thailand, Peninsula Malaysia, and then of course Sumatra and Borneo where we only find them today. And even in Java, there's evidence of Pongo being there as well. So the species that we that have been named thus far in terms of the Pongo lineage pre-modern day uh, uh, orangutans, we have uh, Pongo uh, Widenreiki and Pongo Davosi. Uh, these have been found mostly in China, but also in uh, Vietnam as well. Uh, in Vietnam, we have a lot of indi uh, different named individuals, uh, uh, Huijerai, uh, uh, Chioconi, uh, Kalkai, uh, along with the uh, uh, Weidenreiki and Davosi. And these are all, um, again, they, they found uh, pieces and, uh, and spec um, parts of skeleton, not the whole entire uh, skeleton, uh, but just by what they have found, uh, the, there's that similarity. Uh, again, a lot of teeth are found. Uh, teeth are often found in the fossil record because they're just so sturdy. Because they're only they're the only exposed bone, um, uh, they're made much stronger. So they tend to withstand uh, time and elements and things like that. Okay, in Java, we have Pongo uh, ja uh, javensis. Um, they were slightly smaller than the uh, modern day orangutan. Um, oops, there we go. Uh, in uh, Sumatra, we have uh, Dubwasi. Uh, they were slightly larger than modern day orangutans. And then we have uh, Paleo Sumatrensis. Paleo Sumatrensis is interesting. It was also a small orangutan, but we think that it is from this group that the modern day orangutan uh, may have uh, emerged from. In, in closer in time, okay? Um, and that it might be a sister taxon to Tapanuliensis, Abelii, and Pygmaeus. And those three are the current three species of orangutans living today. Okay, so uh, today uh, we only find, as I may have mentioned already, uh, we only find, sorry, <laughs> we only find orangutans uh, in the island of Sumatra, which is right here, and Borneo, which is right here. Okay, now Borneo, bear in mind, is, uh, is made up of uh, three different countries. The, the mar major portion here is, belongs to Indonesia, as does Sumatra. And then the northern part is split in two regions, Sarawak, which is here, which belongs to Malaysia, Sabah, which is up here, which also belongs to Malaysia. And then Brunei sits right about here. And Brunei has no resident population of orangutans, but I'm sure they have migratory individuals that go through. Okay, now when we look genetically at the current uh, extant uh, orangutans or modern living orangutans, there is, there is more diversity genetically within the Sumatran group um, and so than there is in the Bornean group. And usually when we see that, it means that that's probably the group of origin. And we do the same thing when we look at human evolution. The most, the highest degree of genetic variation occurs in Africa. So that means that's probably the originating group that then, uh, that then migrated out and took the different genetics outside of Africa. But the, uh, every um, genetic material present outside of Africa all, all exists within Africa. So that makes it the original group. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so, um, so because of that, the Sumatran uh, orangutan is probably the original that came into that region. And then from that group, uh, diversified and moved out of the area that they came into and then moved further east, slightly north to get the different species that we see today. Okay, so um, the, the different species of orangutan that exist um, vary uh, slightly visually. They show differences in hair, length of hair, hair type, hair color. 
Uh, presence of facial hair varies as well, whether they've got a beard and a mustache or just a beard uh, or just a mustache, um, how long they are, the, you know, the, the coloring of the beard as well changes and it might be different from the color of the rest of the hair on the body. Uh, the throat pouch uh, changes in size and shape as well. Um, the uh, orangutans do get this uh, rather large throat sack. Uh, it does not inflate as we see in some uh, species that have a throat sac. Uh, it might add to some amplification of the calls that they make, uh, but not, not by much. Also the cheek phalanges, orangutan males get these large cheek pouches on, on the side of their faces and the shape and structure of those cheek pouches also change from species to species slightly. Uh, some are covered with hair, some are not. There are cranial features as well uh, uh, in terms of the structure of the skull. And of course there are changes in the teeth. The teeth have a lot to do with what they are eating. And then of course the genetic differences. Um, uh, when we have subspecies, that means the genetic difference is not enough to warrant them having separate species status. But when we see a greater degree of uh, genetic difference, usually over uh, 7%, uh, then uh, it warrants it being its own uh, species group, 0.07%. Okay, so the first group I'm going to look at, I'm gonna just explain a little bit about is the Bornean orangutan species. This is Pongo pygmaeus. And it has uh, three subspecies. Uh, I think there are four, but, uh, uh, but right now there are three subspecies. And I'm gonna show maps in a moment of where they're located. So the three uh, subspecies are Pongo pygmaeus pygmaeus. Uh, these are found in the Northern part of the island of Borneo and slightly West. Uh, this encompasses Sarawak, which is uh, Malaysian Borneo to the, uh, to the Northwest and West Kalimantan. Kalimantan is the uh, Indonesian portion of the island of Borneo. Uh, and then there's Pongo pygmaeus wormii. They're kind of central and slightly west on the island of Borneo. And then there's the Pongo pygmaeus morio, which are the furthest east and slightly north. And it's this population that uh, I think are two separate subspecies. Those that are in Kalimantan in the Indonesian portion uh, to the east and to the north of Kalimantan region, and then those that are in uh, Sabah, which is the northernmost part of the island to the east. And then we have the Sumatran orangutan species, and here's where we have those two species with the newly named uh, Pongo tapanuliensis. Pongo abelii, which is in the northernmost region of the island of Sumatra in the Aceh province, uh, which is the northernmost bit. Again, I'll have maps coming up in a moment. And then uh, uh, Tapanuliensis, which is sometimes called the Batantoru uh, orangutan, which is slightly south of, um, of Aceh region. Okay, so here's a map. So this is the island of Sumatra here. This group right up in here is the Abelii group. This is Aceh province right up here. And then this little bitty purple bit right here, this is the Tapanuliensis group found right here. It's just south of, the, uh, of a volcano caldera, a collapsed uh, volcano that sits right here. That's gonna become important in a moment. And then we've got the Pongo pygmaeus uh, group. Here's Borneo. So this bit right here, this is uh, Sarawak, this is Saba, this is Kalimantan. And then this right here is uh, Brunei. So uh, Pongo pygmaeus pygmaeus is in this region here, and you'll see it straddles the border between Sarawak and Kalimantan to the northwest. Wormii is here sort of central and west as well. And then these are the two groups of Morio. So this is the Kalimantan uh, Morio group, and this is the Saba Morio group. And they've been separated for a very long time, which is why I suspect that they're um, two separate subspecies now. I'm not the only one, it's not just me. <laughs> but um, but uh, genetic testing is being done to see if that is indeed the case. Okay, so, um, so when we look at this, uh, these three species, what happened was that uh, at some point uh, in, in, in our past when there was our last great ice age around that time, which was roughly anywhere between 
uh, you know, around 20 million years ago, or 20, 20,000 years ago or so, um, where we had our last great ice age. And what happens is, is that when the world is locked in ice, the areas that are warm don't get all that much colder, but they do get drier and the water levels decrease because a lot of the water is locked in ice. And so what happens with that is that the more land mass is exposed. And so you get easier movement from uh, on, on the land masses when areas are dry. So this is Southeast Asia. Uh, here is when you've got less water in the oceans and you've got more mass, land mass exposed. So as you can see, it's easy to come in from this region here, which is currently mainland um, Asia going down into Southeast Asia here. And so there's a you know, freedom of movement here. Once the water begins to, the ice begins to melt, the climate begins to get warmer, then you start getting more water uh, in the oceans and the water levels rise. And a lot of these areas become flooded and have remained flooded. And so you get then, uh, this is Peninsula Malaysia here, here's Sumatra, here's Borneo, here's um, Java down here. This is Papua, Sulawesi, and over here you've got Australia. And so once they get into these regions, then they can become isolated. Okay, so, um, okay. So um, I mentioned a bit ago about that volcano and the caldera. This is the, the what's called the Toba caldera right here. And what we think occurred is that uh, an orangutan group came down from uh, uh, Peninsula Malaysia down and made their way into this region here of uh, Sumatra. Uh, they settled in this region here and uh, and from this region here, you know, they may have scattered a little bit north. They may have even come south. There is no resident population currently in the southern part of Sumatra. They may have existed there thousands of years ago. Currently, uh, the only orangutans that are in the southern part of the island of Sumatra are in this region right here and here. These are where they've been releasing orangutans in these forests here. Uh, the, uh, and they're releasing the abelii into these regions here. Okay, so so we think that that migration uh, happened uh, uh, roughly anywhere between uh, 3 million years ago or so coming down into the island and then at around uh, 500 or 400,000 years ago, they might have started then uh, moving uh, over to, uh, uh, to moving further east. Okay, so we think that somewhere between around 21,000 years ago or and 400,000 years ago that we started seeing this geographic separation of these groups, some moving further north, some staying where they are, and some continuing east. And again, this is not unlike human migration that we've seen. If we, it almost, in a sense, mimics the migration from uh, early human populations coming out of um, northeastern uh, Russia into uh, what is now uh, uh, Alaska, and then coming down the western coast of uh, the United States and then migrating south as well as then migrating east. So we see a similar pattern. Okay, so uh, about 75,000 years ago, Mount Toba, which was of an active volcano, collapsed and that formed the caldera. And we think that that's where the, uh, the two groups of Sumatran orangutans may have then finally split off from each other, where there was no contact between the two groups. And so uh, the Tapanuliensis would have been the original orangutan species that then gave birth to a belly which moved north and over time never contacted each other again. And that's when speciation happens, where you've got one group that's being separated for a long enough time using different resources, um, uh, sharing only those particular genetics and over time they can become a separate species. Okay, so um, I just said that. <laughs> okay, so also um, the uh, Tapanuliensis being the, uh, um, the possible ancestor of 
the living orangutans today is that when we look at the genetics of the Bornean orangutans, they actually are much closer to the Tapanuliensis. So the Bornean group may have moved, started moving uh, east before the split between uh, the, uh, the abelii and the Tapanuliensis. So here's some photographs coming up. This is a, a, a Tapanuliensis male. I'm just gonna be comparing males right now so you can kind of visually see the difference. So with the, here you can see he's got both a mustache and a beard. The cheek pads are fairly flat to the side and they're covered with fine hairs, which we see of, of, the, um, of the abelii as well. Here's abelii. Um, Again, you can see the uh, mustache as well as a beard, the rather flat um, uh, cheek pads. His cheek pads are uh, not as wide as they will eventually get, but you can see the, the little hairs here uh, on, their, uh, on the faces so that uh, they're structurally, uh, visually more similar to uh, the uh, Tapanuliensis here. This is Wormbii. Now we're shifting over to uh, Borneo and we can start to see already that there's a change uh, in the uh, cheek pads. Now, yeah, there's lots of other changes that occur, but this is just a quick visual so that you can see what's happening. We tend to lose the hair as soon as we get to Borneo. The uh, cheek pads are uh, naked skin. Uh, the little white hairs are gone, but we still have the remnants of a slight beard, uh, a mustache and a beard, and the rich red hair. The hair does change as we move east. It tends to be much lighter and much more orange and bright when we're in Sumatra. And then as we move uh, east, uh, they tend to get darker and darker. And by the time we get to uh, Morio, which is on the eastern coast, uh, they get quite dark, almost maroon in color. Here's Pongo pygmaeus pygmaeus. This is now in the central west region. Um, here's another large male. The males are quite large. The females are about half the size of the, uh, of the males. Orangutans are interesting. I mean, I didn't want to get into too much of the history of orangutans' behavior because we just don't have the time. Look at my time. Um, so I don't want to get too far. But what's interesting orang about orangutans is that they, they don't fit the typical model uh, when we look at uh, uh, primates and how social they are. They are definitely social. I don't like to use to use the word solitary with orangutans. I prefer to think that they're just much more independent. <laughs> but uh, everybody knows where others are in their area. Uh, but the males tend to uh, range on their own. Females tend to range with their offspring. Uh, but females do tend to be near where the larger males exist. And uh, the, uh, the males also have two forms. They have sub-adult males and adult males. Uh, the adult males have the big cheek pads, larger body size, um, much longer hair. The younger males tend to have narrow, uh, really either absent cheek pads or just tiny ridges. Um, and uh, they're not as large in size. Uh, they used to think that it was the presence of a large male that prevented the secondary hormonal release of those younger males so that they get bigger. But it seems now that they control it themselves and they're actually more successful in terms of breeding if they keep themselves small because as they move through an area, uh, the bigger males will see these younger males and think, oh, they're not a threat to me, so I'll let them in my territory. And meanwhile, they go in and, and have sex with the females. Uh, the females prefer the larger males, so sometimes the younger males will force copulations uh, with those females. Uh, I kind of went off on a track on that, sorry. <laughs> okay, and then the, uh, the this is the Far Eastern group, uh, Pongo Pygmaeus morio. And already now you can start seeing a difference. Uh, th those cheek pads are getting folded slightly over. So rather than being closer towards the, the flat side of the face, they're really kind of curling in. And that seems to be more apparent in the uh, uh, morio group. And this is uh, Pago, Pango Pygmaeus morio in Saba. Um, uh, so this is what I think might be a possible, uh, so a different subspecies from the morio in Kalimantan, but we'll see. But look at how dark they are. Remember we started off, they were really this kind of bright orange here. Uh, and then as we move further east, they really can get almost that maroon color, quite amazing. 
Okay, now um, with the, uh, the naming of this new uh, group of uh, Tapanuliensis, there's more inf information now that has emerged about how unique they are. And they really are quite special, I think. So um, uh, this is a, a, a Tapanuliensis female with twins, which is pretty exciting. Uh, it's difficult for a female to give birth to twins. The resources that she needs have to be um, right on point or else uh, it'll be difficult to produce enough milk for, uh, for two infants. Um, so it's always special when we see uh, twins. But look, you can, again, you can see how really orange and more brightly colored they are from the, uh, from the Eastern group. Uh, here's another close-up of the uh, male from, um, uh, from the Tapanuliensis group. Again, you could see those really flat, really side uh, cheek pouches and the little white hairs that cover them. Really beautiful. Um, this, is a, oops, this is a youngster venturing forth on their own. Uh, Gabby mentioned earlier that uh, 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 given infants eventually get brave enough to venture forth from mom. Uh, Ryan 10 infants do the same. Uh, at around two years of age, they start feeling much more independent uh, and they start experimenting moving away from mom, but mom is still very close. Uh, orangutan moms with their offspring uh, have a very close bond with their uh, infants and uh, spend uh, up to eight years, sometimes even more, uh, with their offspring uh, before they, uh, the offspring leave and, um, and start finding uh, territories and mates of their own, although the female offspring tend to stay closer to uh, mom's territory. Here's an older sub-adult male. Um, uh, he's not fully adult, but he's big in size. His cheek pads haven't really uh, expanded yet, uh, and he's probably having more success uh, uh, mating and has more overall fitness uh, by keeping himself uh, under the radar of, of a large male. Here's an, oops, sorry. Here's an adult male making a long call. Our orangutans don't make a whole lot of noise. They are definitely vocal, um, but they don't, they're not as vocal as some other primates, um, uh, but they do make noise. Uh, males make a long call. Sounds like a long, really loud yawn. Uh, and, um, that will attract the, that uh, defines their territory as well as it'll attract a uh, female. So the females will find those larger males that they prefer to breed with. And so they'll hear the long call of the male and make their way towards the area when they're breedable. Now, one of the really interesting things we've, uh, um, we've learned about the Tapanuliensis is that they harvest caterpillars. And it's really fascinating because we are used to hearing about fruit mastings where you've got, uh, you know, every couple of years, um, you've got lots of food, of fruit being produced at the same time in an area. And, uh, and the same seems to occur with caterpillars where they have uh, caterpillar mastings. And so uh, the Tapanuliensis seems to be aware of this uh, time frame. Uh, orangutans too, do carry visual maps in their head of their territory. And so they know when uh, trees are fruiting and uh, when, um, where the best sleeping trees are and the best eating leaves are and clearly where the caterpillars are. And what you see them here, it's hard to see the lines, but these caterpillars are actually suspended from tiny silk um, uh, strings, strands. And these are a, are a particular type of uh, moth caterpillar whose name I should know and it escapes me now. Um, but here you see two Tapanuliensis harvesting these caterpillars that are suspended from these silken threads. So pretty interesting. Okay, so um, also other interesting things that we've learned from Tapanuliensis is that the big males, um, uh, all great apes make nests. And so um, with orangutans, they'll fold, have this intricate folding of the leaves uh, in, the, in the trees to make a kind of hammock of woven leaves that they sleep in. And some orangutans, there's different nest cultures within orangutans. Uh, some make a day nest as well as a night nest. Uh, others make a double nest, one above and below. Others we will reuse nests. Some will always make a new nest. 
And what's interesting with the tapanuliensis, especially with the males, is during the day, rather than make a day nest, they will just rest between and sleep in on larger branches and just drape their body uh, on these larger branches to sleep rather than making a day nest. Uh, they still make a nest at night though. Okay, uh, now as with uh, all the orangutan species, they are critically endangered right now, uh, all the orangutans, but the tapaduliensis is particularly at risk because there's only about 800 individuals of these founding orangutan. Uh, um, and so it's really um, crucial that we try to protect them. Um, they probably, I don't, I don't mean to sound negative, but uh, they probably will go extinct, I have a feeling, because there is a hydroelectric dam that is being planned to move into that region where the uh, Tapanuliensis is. Uh, different efforts are being made to try to stop it, but it seems as if the, uh, the Indonesian government is doubling down on wanting that dam. So different conversations are being had right now as to uh, what to do and how best to deal with this issue. They are trying to get the dam stopped, but that's, that's proving very problem, problematic right now. Um, so will they move the individuals out of the area? Will they adapt on their own? Because the, the, the dam will go right through their very small um, habitat. So we'll have to see moving forward what happens with that. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Um, again, our hope is that we protect all non-human primates uh, from extinction. That's our task. And for you youngsters out there, that's your challenge moving forward. Uh, but so, terima kasih. Thank you very much. And um, I will stop sharing and we'll see if we have any questions. Did I, do, did I talk too fast? I talk really fast, I do. I'm sorry about that. Yes. I just wanted to point out also, apart from the dam that has been on hold for the last three years because of uh, delays, you know, and stopping the uh, Bank of China from financing it and the government. Yeah, but they have a new backer now. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, uh, that is one of the big threats, but also Jardine Matheson, who owns now the mine that has been there for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, has started to clear area in the habitat region. And we would like people to know about that and take action. Um, we've running a we're, we've been running a petition for a while uh, to draw attention. Working with Mighty Earth, who's in consultation with Jardine Matheson, to rehabilitate the area and to to promise again to stop further destruction, to get at the underlying, you know, soil and ore that might be beneath those uh, forests. So they made that promise when they purchased the area, but they just haven't uh, apparently kept it. They haven't been watching uh, the company that works uh, under their, their umbrella. Uh, and we, we want to actually get to the bottom of it, make sure that this doesn't continue. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know, sometimes when we talk about uh, forest degradation, we tend to focus on palm oil, uh, but there are other threats as well. The mining companies are a huge threat that move into the area. Um, uh, Indonesia is, is very rich in, in natural resources and they're constantly being under threat uh, from outside interests as well as internal interests to, um, to get at those natural resources. So it's not just a palm oil issue, it's a mining issue um, and, uh, and that's a big problem. So thank you, thank you for bringing that up. Um, the, uh, the Bank of China was the original backer for the, the hydroelectric dam. They pulled out because of, of international pressure, but now there seems to be a new um, uh, uh, group in the offing that's willing to foot the bill. So we'll see what happens with that. But there are lots of petitions circling online um, uh, so that if you, uh, if you investigate those and we try to get the word out there and uh, speak up and maybe we might be able to do something. It's, uh, it's becoming a bit of a challenge because the Indonesian government has gotten a bit more aggressive against people speaking up out about that uh, hydroelectric dam. So um, it's, uh, it's problematic on multiple levels. But yeah, um, any other comments or questions or just wanting to add to the discussion? Absolutely, please feel free. Oh, Mark, go ahead. 
Hi, Rafael. Uh, I'm, I know you didn't uh, plan to talk too much about uh, behavior, but I'm really interested in the um, that adult subadult phenomenon. I know that's been identified both in the wild and in different zoos. Um, so I, I think I've been reading about that now for, I don't know, 20, 25 years or so, but I, I can't ever I can't ever find any really good data on how this this works in the wild. And I'm wondering if you're familiar with any study or anything that's going on right now that that is really trying to quantify um, these alternative re, uh, reproductive strategies and how effective they are. And I think it's really interesting that you mentioned that there's this one sort of semi subadult male, which I think is kind of interesting because my understanding was that once the hormonal suppression process start, uh, stops, it's just a rapid shift into that full-blown adulthood appearance. It, it can kind of There seems to be some variety. We do have Anne with us. So if Anne can respond to that. Un unmute Anne, hold on. Anne yeah. currently yeah. actively okay. doing Okay, so you know, there's, there's fast and there's fast. Um, <laughs> all right. It still takes a while because going from, uh, we don't even call them subadult males anymore. We call yeah. them unfledged males. They're unfledged. fully adult. They reproduce. So they're adult. Um, but there is a great increase in weight involved in getting from unfledged to fledged. And you got to eat an awful lot to make that happen. So you can't do it overnight. And certainly, for example, if you're in Borneo, where food supplies are bad, especially in East Borneo, it's not like you could just go into McDonald's and load up with 35 hamburgers and go for it. Uh, you get ears when the food supplies are very poor or you're in an area that is very poor. So for an unflanged male to get to adulthood, there are a lot of conditions that have to favor it. You may have to work, for example, where we are, uh, El Nino cycles are very important. So you might have to wait four or five years, I'm exaggerating, but you might have to wait that long before food conditions are good enough to support you doing it, or before you're big and strong enough to muscle out somebody else who would also like to have the resources you wanna eat. So yeah, fast, but not that fast. So is there any sense of what that, that fast range is, like a year to three years or a year to five years or something like that? Well, my guess is it's highly variable. So you, that, that was part of my point. It's highly variable, you I, couldn't tell. Zoo people might be able to give you an indication of how quickly it could go because food is readily available in zoos and they're watching them right. every day. Uh, I'm sure there are people who study adult male orangutans. I don't specifically, but I'm sure you could track down people who know more about that and could probably answer the question for you. Okay, thank you. I could probably find you an article if you want to drop me a note. I'm sure there's an I, article out there. I would, I would love to. I would love to to read something. Okay, yeah. drop me a note. Raphael has I got will. my email address. Uh, drop me a note, and I'll see what I can dig up. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. There's some questions here in um, in. Oh yeah, too fast for me. I know. I'm so sorry. I tend to talk. For, also, I'm losing my voice. So I'm trying to get it out before it, it goes completely. So, um, okay, so there's questions. Do we have an estimate of how long ago orangutans were living in Vietnam? Uh, I think the estimates, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, are more kind of in the hundreds of thousands of years ago, uh, not, too, not too recent time, but I would have to double check that. So I'm not 100% sure about that. Another question is how did a human migration to Sumatra and Borneo compare? Well, human migration, sorry, <laughs> human migration into the region happened roughly around, we think, maybe about 20 to 30,000 years ago. So we're kind of really recent arrivals. So there probably was a lot of competition between this other now large primate coming into the area. Um, but orangutans were definitely there uh, first. Um, what other cultural traditions differ? Okay, well, a lot of the, when we're looking at cultural traditions, a lot of them are rooted in tool use. So there are different tool cultures that we see throughout orangutans. Um, a lot is, is food-based in terms of how difficult it is to extract the food that they want. So, you know, in Sumatra, they'll make leaf pads like mitts to protect themselves from the thorniness of certain foods. 
Others, um, uh, you know, uh, use uh, other methods, you know, stones, things to get uh, 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 foods open. We have them fishing for termites. Others will break a termite nest and drop it into the water, uh, allowing the, um, the termites and the eggs to float on the water surface and get the food that way. So, uh, I, and then there's also the nest making culture varies as well. I don't know, Anne, if you wanna add anything to that. Yeah, a couple I'm thinking of are things like, well, not vocalizations, but making sounds. Uh, for example, a kiss squeak, you could do, yeah, or mm -hmm. you can use your hand or you can do it against the bark of a tree. Um, and different communities tend to have different patterns, probably because kids pick it up from their mother. So you tend to perpetuate the pattern that's in the particular area you're in. Um, yeah, food processing, processing as well. Uh, same thing, there are particular techniques you need to get particular kinds of food. Um, and some groups may use their mouth almost, uh, almost completely. Others are gonna be using their hands. Others are using tools. So all of those kinds of learned abilities are, are obviously perfect ground for cultural transmission or cultural cultural practices. Right. I'm so glad Ed was here. Okay. <laughs> you got <to> pay me. <laughs> and then uh, another question here is, uh, why is there a more complete fossil record for orangutans? I sort of addressed this. You may have come on late, uh, uh, Jessica, but the... Um, the orangutans actually migrated through different areas, and that's why we could track it. Whereas the chimps and gorillas and bonobos pretty much stayed in there in that sub-Saharan region, so they didn't really uh, range too far outside of their their uh, existing territory. So that's why we're able to uh, to track it a little bit easier because they actually moved out of different ranges and into different even different, you know, long stretches of areas rather than into one kind of more uh, um, unique small ecosystem that they have there. Um, also, Gary posted the link to the, uh, to the petition. So if you go into discussions, it's there. Thank you, Gary, for that. Um, so uh, any, any other questions? Did I, did, did I miss any hands? I can't, I can't tell. Is there anybody else that wants to add anything at all? No, we're good? Okay. Again, my apologies for speaking too fast. I, I, I know I'm I know I talk fast. So sorry. I'm from Brooklyn. What do you want? Um, okay. <laughs> Oh, okay, good. Somebody said I wasn't too fast. Okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna now throw it over to Robin, our gorilla person. And uh, so Robin, take it away. Oh, thank you so much. Right, I'll attempt to share my screen. Okay, is that working? Okay. Oh no, am I sharing the <laughs> Okay, there we go. <laughs> there we are. Is that working? Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, Firstly, I want to say a really big thank you for inviting me to talk today. This is, you might not be surprised by this. This is my first talk in California. Uh, <laughs> I was there in real life, but we can dream maybe someday. <laughs> um, and I'm going to talk to you today about intergroup relationships in gorillas. Um, and this is something I've been, really I've been studying since my PhD. So I did my PhD on Western lowland gorillas looking at this. And I'm now looking at this same thing in mountain gorillas and I, th I, th I find it a really fascinating topic um, and one of the reasons I'm so interested in it is to do with human intergroup relationships right we see this really broad spectrum of relationships in humans from extreme aggression where um, kind of the, the aggressive defense of kind of country boundaries and that sort of things so all the way from this extreme aggression to kind of much more cooperative things really cooperative behaviors and when we see kind of we're tolerant towards people we meet in the street, we also can be really cool with our families, but and also at a much larger scale. 
Um, and so this, this broad range in itself is fairly unusual, but really kind of the extent of cooperation that we've built upon our kind of intergroup relationships is something that's led to some of the most unique features of human society, right? Things like our cultural and technological advances are all based on our kind of ability to cooperate with our neighbors and with individuals, even across the globe. So kind of in the way, even where countries can cooperate to make decisions at a global scale now. Um, and so I think all understanding where that came from is all about understanding how we relate to other individuals and the relationships we build with other members of other groups and of other countries even. Um, I also think it's a really key part of many animal social systems and it's received relatively less attention because the kind of intergroup encounters that they have are so much less frequent than kind of the, the relationships that are going on within these groups. Also really important for, for understanding the ways that kind of things like um, ideas and cultural traditions and disease and genes can spread within a population from group to group. So I think they're really important. Um, and in humans, there seem to be two really important um, behaviors that underpin these intergroup relationships. And one of these is territoriality. So the way that we aggressively defend space, uh, we might have kind of country borders that we, we restrict who can cross, but we also have kind of our own private spaces. So we have our houses, we might kind of build a fence around or kind of have a lock on the door and we control who accesses the space. Um, but this is of course not at all unique to humans, right? We see aggressive defense of space and this territoriality in a whole range of other species. Um, and particularly we see it in chimpanzees. And so there's been a lot of comparison between humans and chimpanzees about kind of things to do with potentially the parallels between the way that chimpanzees patrol their territories and the way they violently defend space in, in kind of a cooperative manner and parallels between that and things like modern warfare. So where, where did that sort of behavior come from? There's a lot of comparisons with chimpanzees. Um, but I think this, this strong territoriality that we see in chimpanzees also limits the types of intergroup relationships that are expressed. So if a group is always violently defending their territory against their neighbors, then we don't see that same space for kind of more affiliative relationships that we know are also a really important part of human society. Um, so the second thing that I think uh, really underpins the way that humans interact with, with other groups is our multi-level social structure. So this is the way that our overall society is made up of these distinct hierarchically inclusive levels of association. And I'm gonna walk you through what this is in case it's not something you're that familiar with. Um, so an example of this could be for example, uh, the family group, right? Humans tend to live in, in family groups, but um, multiple families form an extended family, right? So there are kind of, you have your aunts and uncles and cousins, each of which are part of a smaller family group that then make up a larger family group, this larger extended family. And then in a traditional sense, you might, for example, have villages that were made up of multiple extended families. And in humans, it scales upwards and upwards. But these, these kind of uh, levels of social structure really influence how we interact with individuals outside our group. So we have kind of really strong bonds within these groups, for example, within families, and then much weaker bonds with other individuals, for example, within a village. Um, and so you have a really strong bond with another individual within your extended family, but a slightly weaker bond with individuals from another village, and maybe even weaker with an individual from maybe a couple of villages over. And then you would interact really again with someone from that you hadn't met before. So we see this really, um, these real differences in kind of our social preferences and how we interact with other um, individuals outside of our immediate social group. So this is also something that's not unique to humans. We see it in a variety of other species, um, but it's not very well understood in what other species might, of, of apes might see, what other species of apes might show this sort of structure and kind of how this evolved in humans and where this might've come from. Um, so a great place to kind of start in understanding where human intergroup relationships came from and their origins is, is comparing with other African apes. And so there have been quite a few comparisons with chimpanzees, particularly around kind of the origins of these, these more aggressive intergroup relationships. Um, but 
I think there's a lot still we need to learn about kind of the origins of the much more affiliative intrude relationships. Um, there's some really exciting research going on in Bonobos at the moment. I'm pretty fascinated by it. Um, even just a few days ago, I think there was a paper out that showed that um, female bonobos were adopting infants from a neighboring group, which is you know, incredibly affiliative behavior, taking on another individual's um, offspring and kind of raising them as your own. So I think that's really fascinating stuff um, to come from bonobos. But I'm gonna to talk to you today about gorillas. Um, and I think gorillas are a really valuable um, system to study because they're a little bit less closely related, which, um, which you might think is maybe not the the, uh, the place to start. But if we compare only, for example, humans and chimpanzees, and there's a difference, it's really hard to know whether that difference is because something evolved in humans or something evolved in chimpanzees or was lost in chimpanzees or was lost in humans. Um, so by taking kind of a step back um, evolutionarily and comparing slightly more broadly, we can get a better idea of, of what sorts of behaviors might have been present in kind of our common ancestors. Um, another thing that I often forget is that because humans diverged from chimpanzees so soon after they diverged from uh, gorillas, there's actually a lot of our DNA we share with gorillas. Um, and although chimpanzees and bonobos are our closest relative, actually 15% of the human genome is closer to that of the gorilla genome than it is to the chimpanzee genome. So this relatively small proportion of our genome um, suggests that, that there might be kind of a genetic reason why there are some traits that we might see in humans and gorillas and not necessarily see in chimpanzees. So there's kind of genetic reasons potentially for some of these social similarities that we see between humans and gorillas. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you today about Western lowland gorillas and uh, mountain gorillas. So Western lowland gorillas, these ones up at the top, um, as you can see, there's kind of two branches in this, this gorilla lineage, um, the one at the top of the west gorillas and the one underneath the eastern gorillas. And each of those species is made up of two subspecies. Um, and the western lowland gorillas and the mountain gorillas are the ones we know kind of the most about. There's been the most consistent research in them so far. Um, but another reason gorillas are a really useful system for studying is because there's a lot of social similarities between gorillas and humans. So like us, they live in stable family groups, and I say kind of family groups, they're, they're family-ish sort of groups. So it's a, a dominant male, multiple females, and um, all of their offspring. Um, but also in mountain gorillas, you sometimes get multiple adult males in the same group. So it's more of kind of an extended family than your kind of classic nuclear family that you might, might potentially see in, in humans. Um, so they live in these these family-ish groups, um, and each of these groups has overlapping home ranges. And so that means that, that groups are regularly interacting with their neighboring groups. And when they do, sometimes these can be really aggressive, so they can be highly, highly violent, they can be kind of kicking, biting each other, they can be kind of infanticide. Um, sometimes the dominant males could die from the wounds inflicted in these, these intergroup encounters. That's kind of one end of the spectrum, but they can also be really tolerant. So I've seen uh, multiple Western lowland gorilla groups feeding in the same tree incredibly tolerantly. Um, and we even see quite a affiliative intergroup encounters. So this is where kind of the groups will completely intermingle. Maybe some of the young individuals will play together. So there's this really big spectrum of kind of different types of intergroup encounters that we see in gorillas. Um, and we're really only recently beginning to understand how these groups are interacting and how they're sharing space and what, what influences the behaviors we see during these intergroup encounters. And this is what something I've been really interested in studying this last kind of five years or so. Um, so as part of my PhD, I wanted to understand territoriality, right? Because that's kind of a fundamental uh, component influencing how they interact with each other. Um, but one of the problems with trying to understand territoriality is, is you need to understand how multiple groups are moving um, and sharing the space and how they're kind of defending that space. Um, and in Western lowland gorillas, because they're very difficult to habituate, we have in some places where I might have two or three habituated groups, but we don't have the whole population habituated. So what we did to try and understand gorilla ter territoriality, and this is something I did as part of my PhD with Peter Walsh, Jake Dunn, and Magda Bermeja, whose photos are down here at the bottom, um, these guys here. Um, we set up kind of a series of camera traps all across this area of forest in Republic of Congo, 
And then we identified the gorilla groups that were appearing in, in each of these camera traps. So the images that we were collecting from these camera traps, we could then use them to reconstruct their home ranges, um, which is what you can see in the picture here on the left. Um, and so from this, we could then look at how those groups were moving in relation to each other and how the location of neighboring groups home ranges influenced their own use of space. What we found was, was that these movement patterns were consistent with territoriality. So it suggested there might be these kind of core areas that were defended, but then there were these larger regions of kind of more peaceful overlap. But all of this was just based on kind of reconstructing their movement patterns. And we didn't have any direct evidence of, of whether they were really kind of aggressively defending this space or not. Um, but it did suggest that potentially some elements of territoriality going on. Um, we also wanted to understand whether gorillas could have this sort of multi-level social structure that we see in humans too. Um, and to do this, uh, we, we studied Western lowland gorillas at these swampy forest clearings, which are known as buys. And you can see a photo of these um, in the photo on, in the top left. So it's really dense forest. It opens out into these swampy forest clearings. Uh, just beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. <laughs> um, and we get to sit at the edge of these clearings and we have kind of these really, uh, these cameras with these really big zooms, these telescopes, and we monitor all of the gorillas that are kind of coming and going and how those groups are interacting. So the gorillas will come from quite a, a way off to feed at these swampy forest clearings. There's lots of kind of high energy uh, vegetation that they, they feed on. And because these groups are coming from quite a long way away and they're feeding for kind of a number of hours at a time, it's kind of a hotspot for intergroup encounters in gorillas. So it's a great place to kind of look at what the relationships between these groups are like. So from this, we, we reconstructed their, their social network and we found that they do seem to be following the same sort of multi-level social structure that we see in humans, right? So they have their family groups, but they also have these social preferences at this larger scale. Um, and so there are some groups that they tend to interact with much more than others. Um, so at the end of my PhD, I was pretty excited by this, this potential for intergroup relationships in gorillas and understanding kind of the evolutionary origins of our own society by comparing with what we see in gorillas. Because um, one of the things we find is that there is, does seem to be this kind of capacity for these relationships beyond the immediate social group and this kind of larger social structure. And one of the things that's suggested is that maybe this is something that evolved very recently in humans, but actually when we look at kind of gorillas and also in quite a few other ape species, we see that there are these, these relationships that extend beyond the immediate group. And so it seems to be something that has a kind of a much earlier origin than we potentially thought of in the past. Um, and it means that we can use these other species to understand what might the kind of evolutionary benefits to these relationships have been early on when they were kind of initially evolving. I mean, now we have all of these kind of really complex forms of cooperation going on, but was that something that was involved when they were kind of first, um, first being selected for, or, or were there other kind of mechanisms at play? Um, and also really to understand how this, these elements of territoriality, but also these kind of social relationships between groups combine, right? How do they mesh together? And we know that in humans, our relationships are really, are really kind of, influential over how we share space with other individuals. So if we think of this kind of on a personal scale, right, if we have a very close friend, then we might be very happy to find them in our house or to invite them over for dinner, but we wouldn't act the same if we saw a stranger in our house, right? Those are very different things. And part of that is to do with kind of this interplay between our kind of territoriality or our kind of our space use and the relationships we have with individuals. Um, so we need to see whether something like that is also going on in gorillas. Um, so after my PhD, I moved to Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, um, which is pretty incredible in terms of the amount of data they have. It's kind of the longest running um, gorilla research site. So it was set up in 1967 by Diane Fossey, and it's been going ever since. Um, and they've been monitoring the, this population of gorillas um, in Rwanda here, um, up on the, the map on the left. Um, and we're monitoring them every day. And at the moment, it's, I think we're following 10 different groups. So it's a huge number of different groups and we've got information on how they're all uh, using and sharing space, which is exactly what I wanted to, to look at in order to understand this kind of large scale gorilla social structure and what's going on. 
Um, so we have the daily movement patterns of 17 different groups that have been monitored since 2003. And we also have, um, so from this, we can kind of understand their home ranges and we can build these home ranges and also look at how they're interacting with each other and kind of the behaviors that, that occur when they do interact with each other. So what we've got is all of this data on, on their home ranges, but also the encounters that take place between these groups and the behaviors that take place during them. Um, but before I get carried away telling you about these intergroup encounters, a really important um, aspect of, of potentially that potentially influential on these intergroup encounters is, is the kind of larger social system. Um, so as I said before, this kind of typical gorilla system is this one male family group. Um, and when females that are born within those groups reach sexual maturity, they will leave the group and they'll join a new one family group and breed within that group um, and so when males reach sexual maturity they also leave and but they become solitary males so they'll be solitary until they can attract females of their own and then they form a group of their own and that's sort of the kind of dispersal patterns in in general in gorillas um, but in mountain gorillas this is a little bit more complicated and this is because what we find is that actually only about 50 percent of females and males leave their group when they reach sexual maturity. So this means that these one male family groups can grow and grow and they can become multi-male groups. And this is when kind of these males grow up within the group and reach sexual maturity and then don't leave. And so these groups can get really big. So the largest we've seen is 65 individuals, um, which is massive when you think of how these groups are, are really cohesive, right? They're moving around the forest together, they're feeding together, they're building nests at night all together as kind of a unit of up to 65. Um, so there's a lot of individuals to kind of keep track of and kind of to keep as a cohesive unit. So what we find is they grow and grow and eventually they fission in two. And this can be when maybe kind of a young male is coming up and he's you know particularly big and strong and some of the females choose to break off with him and so then we'll have kind of two separate groups that way, or perhaps the dominant male um, might die or might be kind of getting really old and two younger males might take over and, and the group might fission in that way. Um, but what it results in is really interesting social dynamic where these groups, there are two groups that are fissioned and they're entirely independent. They're moving completely independently, but all of the individuals in those groups have all of this shared experience of living together and kind of all these relationships they built whilst they were kind of a single group. Um, and what Melanie Merville found actually during her PhD, she studied these intergroup encounters and these fission patterns. What she found is that these peaceful, peaceful encounters were much more common between groups that had fissioned from each other in the past. What you can see here on the right is a diagram of the fission pattern going on in the population of mountain gorillas that we study since 2003. So you can see on the left, in kind of 2003, 2004, we had these just three really stable groups that we were monitoring. And then around kind of 2007, they started to fission. Um, they've gotten really big. Um, and so uh, kind of later on, we have all of these different groups with different sort of sorts of kind of fission histories, different sorts of fam familiarities with each other. Um, and these lines up at the top are the groups that formed in that more traditional gorilla way of kind of a, a solitary male attracting females. Um, but what we, what we found and what, what Melanie Merville really suggested from, from her PhD is that the because these peaceful encounters are much more common between these fission groups, it suggests that they kind of develop these strong social relationships when they're living in the same group, but they remain after they fission and they're shaping the, the patterns of behavior that we see during these intergroup encounters. So based on all of this, I was just really fascinated to understand kind of the way in which these social relationships influence how gorillas are kind of sharing and defending space. And this really came down to three key questions. One of which was, are these gorillas maintaining these intergroup relationships after they fission? Um, so really confirming what Melanie Merville found. Um, are mountain gorillas territorial? Are they kind of more aggressive in certain regions of their territories than others? Because that's really not something that is necessarily confirmed. And we've got kind of mixed evidence of this in gorillas. So I wanted to understand using kind of more direct evidence what this sort of territoriality in gorillas might look like. Um, 
And finally, I wanted to see whether these relationships are influencing this territorial defense, right? Do groups defend space differently against, against neighbors that they're really familiar with compared to neighbors that they're less familiar with? Um, and so we had this data set based on kind of all of the behaviors that were observed during these intergroup encounters. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what these really look like. So they tend to begin when those two groups approach each other and they might display back and forth. And I've got a video of this, which I hope will work for you. So this you can see is the beginning of an intergroup encounter of two mountain gorilla groups. So you see that they're, they're quite tense, but they're not physically aggressive yet at least, right? So they're really kind of eyeing each other up. They're seeing kind of how the situation plays out. This is a, this is a dominance display from one of the dominant males, the classic uh, ground smack. Um, and you can see they're kind of, they've lined up a little bit and you know some of the younger ones are backing away a bit, but <laughs> throwing a stick. Um, it's, not, it's not aggressive yet. It's just kind of wary really. Um, so in, in almost half of the cases, this is as far as it gets, right? They approach and they'll display, but then they, they part ways and that's kind of all there is to it. Um, in about 20% of cases, these go on to become actually quite affiliative. So this is when the groups will kind of completely intermingle with each other and particularly some of the young individuals will play with each other. And it seems like a really kind of tolerant, um, relaxed sort of uh, encounter. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we also have these really aggressive intergroup inter encounters. So this is encounters that involve kind of a lot of screaming, a lot of running around, kind of kicking, biting, hitting, particularly the, the adult males tend to be involved in these aggressive interactions. Um, and they can be really uh, dangerous from kind of a fitness perspective um, because there's a high risk of infanticide. Um, but also the dominant males can get injured and the dominant male is really kind of holding this whole group together. And if the dominant male dies, then the group tends to disintegrate. Um, and so for females with young offspring, this is particularly dangerous because those young offspring won't tend to be accepted into another group. And so they'll tend to lose any offspring that are kind of under the age of about three um, to infanticide if they join another group. Um, so this, this aggression is really risky. Um, but these are all of the kind of behaviors we, was, we were seeing. We had 175 um, of these intergroup encounters. So we built a database of all of these and we wanted to then build models to predict kind of when do these encounters become affiliative and when do they become aggressive? And we wanted to predict this based on a few things. So the first thing was of course location, right? To get to this idea of territoriality. Are they more aggressive in some places rather than others? Are they more tolerant in some places rather than others? Um, so do, they, do these encounters occur differently depending on whether they're outside the home range, whether they're in the peripheral home range, or whether they're kind of really in this core central area of their home range? Um, so for each intergroup encounter, we assigned one focal group and we looked at where they were within their home range um, when this encounter took place and how that influenced the behavior that took place in the during the encounter. The other key thing we were looking at was of course this fission pattern, right? So had these groups fissioned from each other in the past, were they much more familiar with each other um, or were they kind of relatively unfamiliar, right? They hadn't fissioned from each other in the past. They didn't have this shared experience of living in a group together. We included another, a few other important um, predictors, so kind of the relative number of adult males, because some groups can have say, four adult males and another group can have only one, and that could be really influential. We also looked at the number of encounters uh, within the previous year. So had they bumped into each other kind of five, six, seven times that year already, or was this maybe the first time that they'd seen each other in a while? Um, Okay, so what predicted whether these intergroup encounters became affiliative? What we find is the fission patterns are really, really important, right? This really, this backs up exactly what Melanie Merville found, right? So if they have fission from each other in the past, they're about four times more likely um, to be affiliative during these encounters than if they haven't. Um, and what we find overall with location is that it doesn't seem to strongly predict uh, this affiliative behavior. There might be a slight decline towards the core, particularly in these groups that haven't visioned, but from overall it's not significant. Um, but we also wanted to look at whether this, this kind of, this um, 
affiliation towards groups that they had fissioned from in the past, whether this may be declined over time. So does it matter if these groups fissioned a year ago compared to if they fissioned 10 years ago? Um, and what we found is there wasn't a significant decline over time. And it is in the kind of sort of direction we might expect, and it is potentially approaching significance. Um, so we looked at a time period, I think the largest, uh, the greatest time between visioning and then encountering each other was 10 years in our data set. So maybe if we had another 10 years, there might be kind of, we might reach a point where these groups are no longer affiliative to each other. But at least within 10 years, they really seem to be maintaining these kind of uh, affiliative relationships. Um, so what about aggressive behavior? And here we see that um, the fission history actually isn't significant overall. Um, so there's no significant difference overall, but what we see is that location is really important, right? So they're much less likely to be aggressive kind of outside their home range than they are compared to kind of the central areas of their home range. So it suggests that they are kind of ending certain regions of their home range. But what we were really fascinated by was this difference going on in the peripheral home range, right? Because they seem to show this, this these higher rates of aggression um, towards groups they haven't visioned from in the past, right? Those groups that they're less familiar with, um, but you don't see this heightened aggression in the peripheral home range towards groups that they have visioned from in the past. So what this looks like overall is that these groups that they're unfamiliar with, that they haven't visioned from, they're defending the whole of their home range from them, right? So you see this heightened aggression in the core and in the peripheries of the home range. But for the groups that they have fissioned from in the past, they seem to only be defending kind of the core of their home range. Um, and what's quite interesting is the majority of encounters take place in the peripheral home range here. And so actually, this is a really kind of high proportion of their total intergroup encounters. And there is potentially like a real selective advantage to having this reduced risk of aggression, right? The reduced risk of kind of young group members dying or kind of the dominant male getting badly injured, there's potentially kind of a, a real benefit to maintaining these social relationships. So overall, we did find that gorillas were maintaining these intergroup social relationships after they fissioned from each other, even up to 10 years later. Um, we did see evidence of territorial defense, right? So there was higher rates of aggression in kind of these core areas of the home range compared to outside the home range, but also social relationships were influencing this territorial defense. So within the peripheries, it really depended on the relationships between those groups, whether or not they were going to be aggressive. Um, so what it suggests is that maybe resources and this access to resources and space with this reduced risk of aggression could be an evolutionary benefit to kind of maintaining these long-term intergroup social relationships. <laughs> so that's all I wanted to tell you about today. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that kind of gorillas, there's a lot going on in gorilla society and potentially more than we previously thought. Um, they do live in these kind of family-ish sort of groups, these kind of really cohesive social units, um, but they do seem to have social preferences that extend beyond those groups, right? So they have social preferences for certain groups and not others, and they seem to have this sort of flexible territoriality where kind of they'll defend some of their home range, but not all of it against certain groups, but not others. Um, and I think this makes them a really great um, study system for understanding the evolution of intergroup relationships in general. Um, but I think it makes them particularly crucial for understanding the origins of human social complexity and a large scale cooperation, because we see this whole spectrum of different, different types of intergroup relationships. And it seems that kind of there really are these benefits to maintaining social relationships and that potentially by comparing with gorillas, we can understand where some of the most unusual elements of our own social behaviors come from. Um, but I think overall the argument here is that, that studying apes in general can be really beneficial for, for understanding our own evolutionary origins. And I think Gorillas are one part of that story, but I think studying kind of more broadly and looking at what's going on in chimps and bonobos and also in, in orangutans and gibbons too, we see that there's this hugely flexible social behavior going on and this huge diversity of different types of social behavior. Um, so I think there's a huge amount we can still learn from, from all of the apes and hopefully all of the primates too. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, the work I presented here today was 
based on a huge amount of data that's collected by all of my amazing colleagues at Diane Fossil Gorilla Fund. So really, it's all thanks to, to their hard work um, that's made this possible, particularly my co-authors, Tara Stronsky, Winnie Eckhart, JP Hiller, Veronica Vicelio, and Samadhi Mukia. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. That was that was great. I had no idea that the male bachelor groups got that large. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah. that was a one off and it didn't last long. But yes, but still, it's, it's the just research is due. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That, that was great. OK, sorry. <laughs> OK, let's see. Any questions that anybody wants to just sing out for? Anyone? If not, let me take a look at the. Um, Okay. Okay. So we have one question here, Robin. During encounters where we see affiliative interactions, does any sneaky reading happen between the groups? We haven't observed it. So we haven't seen it. What tends to be more common is that these intergroup encounters are potential opportunities for females to change groups. Um, so they don't have to kind of break out on their own and go find another group. They tend to during these intergroup encounters. So that's another reason why they can get quite aggressive is that it's all about the dominant males showing off how kind of big they are, how good at protecting the group they are, and they might kind of potentially bias some of the females to, to change groups. Um, but I don't think we've seen any, any kind of out-group mating uh, during the intergroup encounters. So also on, off of that, so in terms of infanticide, so do they see it occurring more to the, in the peripheral range or the outside range or in the range? We haven't looked at it yet. Um, I think I think our sample size would be pretty low in terms of the number of infanticide events. It would be really interesting to look at. Um, and you're not the first person that's asked me that. So I think I'm gonna I'm just gonna have to try and try and figure it out. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's hard to say. I think territoriality is just one of the things that is influencing whether they're aggressive or not, right? There's also a lot of other stuff going on. There's a lot about kind of enticing females to change groups or kind of potentially um, infanticide of offspring um, of kind of other groups. So yeah, I, th I think it's quite complex, but, but there's definitely a lot to kind of look at still. Um, we just don't know. Yeah. Design. Have they done have they done genetic tests on offspring to see who's fathering them all? I mean, that's also a kind of interesting thing. Yes. Yeah. And it's um, particularly in the multi male groups. What we find is that it's not always the dominant male. So I think he it, it varies, you know, it varies from kind of 90 percent paternity to I think about kind of 50 percent. So there's some groups where there's kind of three or four dominant males and actually some of them are getting quite a lot of mating opportunities um but I don't think we've come across any cases where where the males that were never in the group that seem to have have sired the offspring I, I I'm not entirely sure um it's not something I've looked into myself so it's possible that that is also happening yeah okay we have another question here are there any ritual behaviors that codify cooperation between groups this is something I'm really interested in, um, and no, not yet. Um, uh, I think one of the things kind of I'm really interested in trying to look at whether there's kind of cooperation going on between different groups. Maybe, for example, if there's a solitary male that's kind of harassing both of those groups, could those groups then cooperate to kind of defend against the solitary male? But we've got you know the sample size we're looking at is so small right so because we're interested in like intergroup encounters where there were multiple groups so like at least two but like three or four groups and we've got maybe kind of nine or ten instances in the last 15 years so i i did look into it and i was like maybe i have enough to study this but not really um uh, not yet but i, I don't know the, the the population's growing a lot and the 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 um the area of habitat they have isn't growing at all. So we have seen a, a real increase in the rates of intergroup encounters. And so it does mean there's, it, I mean, it's quite dangerous for those, those gorillas in terms of kind of the population um, growth, right? We've seen a reduction in population growth because of potentially these violent intergroup encounters. 
but it does provide an opportunity to study them, right? So we might have more and more cases to start mm. looking into what's going on and what's influencing them. Yeah. Okay, another question we have from Gary is that what are the kinds of affiliative behavior between groups and are there differences in intensity and duration? Yes, yes. So, I mean, we, we just had to kind of broadly categorize it. Um, but yes, right, some of these encounters will go on for kind of hours or even kind of multiple days, we've kind of come back and the groups have still, still been mingling. Um, but in other cases, it might only be, say, half an hour. Um, in one case, we had, they were both affiliative, and, uh, I think, at one stage, and then it ultimately became aggressive again at a later stage. Right, so they actually had both of those things going on within the same encounter. So yeah, it's like a really, it is, it is a wide range. We sort of kind of roughly categorize it to kind of make the analysis easier, but there's a lot of different behaviors going on. Okay, the, the last question we have is, is there only fission or fusion that has been observed? I'm wondering a bit about the groups that disappear on the chart you showed of the fission events over time. Do they die, leave the study area, or fuse with an existing group? So it's mostly only fission. And so this will be kind of, but fission takes a while. So they might break apart, they might come back together, they might break apart, come back together, and then finally break apart, right? But they, it's ultimately a process of, of fissioning. Um, but I have observed one case of kind of groups fusing, essentially. And this was actually in the Western Lowland Gorillas when I was at Mbeli Bai. We had kind of two, two aging males that were leading separate groups. And then uh, kind of for about a year, every time they visited, they were visiting together. So they were arriving together and it was kind of a male and maybe a few offspring in both of those groups, but they seem to have fused together. Uh, but that is the only case I've ever heard of, and it was pretty unusual. Um, I think they're writing it up as a paper. I hope they are, because it's, it's just not something you would expect in gorillas at all. Um, right. It's quite interesting. Um, in terms of how, why they disappear, yes, it tends to be that the dominant male will die or the females will just gradually leave him and he'll become solitary again. Um, and that's how kind of groups end. Um, so it is kind of a fusion in the sense that the females might all go off and join another group, but it's not, the male's not also there. It tends to be that kind of they've left the male and formed a new group in, in that way. Okay, oh, uh, let's see, let me see. Uh, I think that's it for in the chat. Does anybody else have any questions they wanna shout out? No? Okay, well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Robin. Okay, uh, Kara, I think we're to you next. All right. Hold on, I got a question or is that a clapping? Let's see, what is that? Is that a clapping? <laughs> yeah, that's just clapping and I'd give her a standing ovation if I could. Oh, okay, whoop, whoop. Thank okay, you. good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead, Kara, sorry. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see, let's try this. All right, are we good here? Yep. Can we see? Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, first, I'd like to thank you guys for having me here. Um, I have to say, I'm a little bit rusty. I've done a little bit more child rearing of my own in the last year than I have. Um, doing talks, but um, I'm getting back into it. Um, it's all good. <laughs> and today I'm gonna to be talking to you guys about chimpanzees. And it's kind of a nice follow-up to Robin's wonderful talk on gorillas because it's, it touches on sort of similar topics um, and in sort of focusing on female dispersal. So the chimp social system is, is pretty different from what we were just talking about in gorillas. So when I sort of go through that and sort of think about dispersal theory and sex bias dispersal in chimpanzees. Okay, let's see. Okay, so first I just like to make sure we're all on the same page understanding what's going on with the chimpanzee social system. And it's very different from all the great apes that we've heard about today. Um, it's very similar to bonobos, which you'll hear some about next. But um, what we have going on with chimps is that they don't fission and fusion sort of between groups, but rather within their one home community. So they have, they do form permanent communities of 
sort of average 60 individuals, but they can range up to 200 sort of at the extreme, be as small as maybe 10 at the minimum. And within a community, all of the members are generally friendly towards one another. I mean, they're, they're aggressive in instances, but usually they're friendly and they know each other. They will travel together, but they are rarely, really never all together at the same time. So you won't come across 60 chimpanzees um, if the group size is 60. So that's unlike what we we're just hearing about in gorillas. They don't all travel together. Instead, what they do is they form uh, what we call parties or subgroups. And these can really change in composition hourly, even um, daily. Sometimes they might travel together sort of in a more cohesive party for a couple of days. But usually you have individuals coming into the party, leaving the party um, at various times throughout the day. Um, and what we see is that in general, the males are very gregarious and cooperative with one another. So you tend to see larger parties when you have males. They'll travel in groups of you know, five, six, up to 20 males. Certainly, if they're sexually receptive females, they're going to be joining these parties as well. Males um, are very affiliative with one another. They will groom for long hours. They participate in um, a lot of sort of more overt cooperative behaviors than what we see in the females. They do defend their territory, as Robin was talking about, and they do this cooperatively. So they go out to the edge of their community range and sort of look for other groups. Um, very different from what we were just hearing about. Um, generally, these encounters are hostile, especially if there's a numbers advantage from one community to the other. There's usually aggression involved. If um, they feel that there, that's maybe an unfair advantage, usually they just vocalize at each other and then retreat. But the males are pretty active in this um, boundary patrol kind of behavior. Females um, will participate sometimes. Females certainly join these large parties. Um, definitely when they're sexually receptive, sometimes when they're not. But if they have dependent offspring, they, are, they more often just travel alone and will sort of really concentrate their foraging in what we call core areas. So these areas are inside the community range. They come and go as they please, but if you're gonna find a female alone, you sort of know where she might be. She maybe is in the central part of the range all the time or, or the Southern part of the range. So what we see between males and females, even within a chimpanzee community is very different behaviorally. And this is true of the sort of East African subspecies that we're talking about. It's a little bit different when we're talking about um, Western chimpanzees. So within that larger sort of socioecology of chimpanzees, we know that really across all field sites, what's sort of static is that all males are philopatric. There's one field site in West Africa where a few males have gone, but it's um, sort of a really fragmented one. Every other field site where chimpanzees have been studied, the males will remain in the group that they're born in um, for their entire lives. Now, in contrast, we see that most females disperse and Really up until five, 10 years ago, um, a lot of folks would argue that really it was all females that dispersed. And maybe there were a few cases where they didn't, but these were really oddball females, maybe orphans, um, maybe some strange reason why they weren't dispersing. And this is actually the opposite pattern than what we see in most non-apes, um, non really, when we're talking about primates baboons, old world monkeys, circopithecines, et cetera. Usually you get uh, male dispersal rather than female dispersal, yeah. And so this, I just sort of wanna take a brief moment to talk about dispersal theory and why this matters, why it matters which sex goes, which sex doesn't, what that might mean when thinking about ape evolution and into thinking about human evolution as well. So generally, when you're thinking about dispersal theory, which sex is gonna go, which sex isn't, it's the identity of the dispersing sex relates to an organism's social system and the non-dispersing sex has the most to gain from philopatry. So in the, the more general primate pattern, it's the female that has the most to gain from philopatry because she has the heaviest burden of reproduction. She's the one gestating and lactating. So being around familiar kin in a familiar space can really sort of accelerate the reproductive schedule. So the question then is sort of why has this switched in many of the ape species? We know in gorillas, it's, it's somewhat bisexual, but really it's the females the males will go and have that solitary phase. Um, females are dispersing, so they're sort of bisexual, but we're, we're starting to get to the female bias dispersal in gorillas. And then in um, chimpanzees and bonobos, we see where all males are philopatric, and then we see this um, generally female dispersal. And then in humans, again, we think it's probably bisexual dispersal. So sort of what's, what's happening in the, the ape group that's different from the other groups. And so my research really is focusing in on chimpanzees and what's going on here. And so what 
people often talk about when trying to figure out, you know, well, which sex should go, they really waste a lot of ink talking about these two topics, inbreeding risk. So of course, you know, if both sexes stay in the community that they're born in, you're going to have an accumulation of relatives in that group. And over time, you're gonna increase your risk of inbreeding. But that's not the only reason why you might see sex bias dispersal. There are plenty of examples where intrasexual competition over food or mates can also drive dispersal patterns. So if there's, there's a high degree of competition between one of the sexes, they might be more likely to leave and sort of seek greener pastures elsewhere. But what my research argues is that we're sort of overlooking a third component here, and that's intrasexual cooperation for food or mates. And uh, myself and um, members of my research group think that this might be particularly important for thinking about um, chimpanzee dispersal. So what do we know about chimpanzee dispersal? Um, as I've already talked about, as you've heard about before, males defend their territory. And we think that this is facilitated by having close kin as well as cohort mates around. So males are very cooperative with their brothers. We have documented this at numerous field sites. They also cooperate quite readily with um, non-kin as well. And we think that these really strong bonds formed over childhood and then throughout their entire lives facilitate this cooperation to defend the territory. We have good evidence that shows um, from several chimpanzee field sites that as range, as community range size expands, for instance, female interbirth interval goes down, they're able to have more females in the community. So there's um, higher reproductive success in that instance. There's more food available to the females. So we think all of these things sort of make it an advantage for the males to stay and defend the territory so that their individual reproductive um, success will increase. So what then sort of the traditional thought of chimpanzee socioecology was that, okay, that makes sense. So females must leave to avoid inbreeding. If the males are staying to defend the territory, the females are going to go. And that sort of explains why we see this reversal pattern. However, the story is sort of changing um, in the last 10 years. So you know, my question here is, is female dispersal conditional? That is, are there factors present at the time of dispersal that an individual female can decide whether to disperse or not? Is it that they all just go because that's sort of the, the innate condition of chimpanzees or is it that circumstances can dictate whether females disperse or not? And again, very up until very recently, we thought that pretty much all females went and there's always been an anomaly in the Casa community at Gombe National Park where going back to the 1960s, researchers have known that not everybody disperses. We're now accumulating more data from long-term field sites. And what you see here is um, a map that I borrowed that shows um, the dozens of sites where chimpanzees are studied throughout Central Africa. This sort of um, highlights their range here. But what's important here is that there are only maybe eight to 10 sites where they really have good long-term behavioral data and can follow females from birth um, through their dispersal. And what we're finding more and more is that it does seem like not all females disperse. Some females are remaining philopatric in their natal community. We now know um, from data at about six sites that the numbers range from 10 to 50% of females with a median at about 25% of females remaining philopatric. So this number isn't insignificant. At every site, we seem to have a handful of females that stay behind and reproduce in their natal community. They're staying there with their maternal brothers, with their paternal brothers. So it's, it's an interesting question, sort of what's happening with these females versus those that disperse. And something that um, has come to light sort of from the beginning with the Casa data and now subsequently is that in most cases, the females that are staying behind are daughters of high powered mothers, high ranking mothers. So that already is sort of uh, an inkling that maybe something interesting is going on with these particular females that stay behind. So this has been the basis for my research since my PhD, which I finished in 2015 and then in my research subsequently. And all of my research has primarily taken place at Gombe National Park, Tanzania, which is the chimpanzee equivalent to the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund that we just heard about. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with Gombe National Park. It was, of course, um, the park, uh, sorry, the study site founded by Jane Goodall in 1960. 
And data collection has been continuous really since then, and it's been systematic since the early 70s. So this park is uh, along the shore of Lake Tanganyika. It's very mountainous. We have sort of a, a variety of habitat types. We have deep um, sort of evergreen forest in the river valleys. We have some more woodland type areas on the slopes. And then we have some quite high elevations that are primarily grasslands. The chimps don't much use this upper area except maybe to cross it on occasion. So this is a really great field site to think about female dispersal. And it's due both to the longevity of the data collection and the, um, the fact that there are two habituated communities. So data first, data collection first started in the 19, sorry, in 1960 in this large Casa community. All the individuals here were known by about 1965 and systematic data collection began in 1973. The same type of collection that went on in 1973 is happening today right now, presumably. Um, and all of that data is now housed at Arizona State University, recently moving there from Duke University. Uh, then in the 80s, they started looking northward, thinking that perhaps they should habituate this northern Matumba community. And so they were first absor observed in the mid 1980s with all individuals known by 1994 with systematic data collection beginning in 1995. So we now have two communities where we can follow individuals from birth um, in Cascala. We can go back in a few rare cases up to six generations um, in Matumba, uh, probably tapping out about three generations here. Now we use a, a varied methodological approach. My research builds upon the research of a lot of other people. We have Tanzanian researchers who are going out every day collecting sort of the general behavior data. Then we have various Tanzanian and foreign researchers who collect more um, specific types of data. We also do physiology through fecal sample collection. We get genetic information. So we know the paternities of pretty much all the infants born in the two communities going back to the mid nineties. We can look at space use. We have sort of, it's just a treasure trove of data. There are so many questions we can ask using this data. This is just sort of, of fun to, again, highlight how important Gombe is to ask questions about female dispersal and, and being able to really follow females. At most sites, there's only one habituated community. So if a female matures and leaves, you lose, lose track of her and can't really follow her to a new community. Similarly, if a female comes in to that community, you don't know anything about her, um, her infant and juvenile period. So here we can really follow these females. And here we're looking at one of the most famous lineages from the Gombe data, Flo was a favorite of Jane Goodall's, an old female when she first arrived. She was a somewhat prolific reproducer herself. She had a daughter, Fifi, who stayed in the community. And Fifi uh, was the most prolific reproducer we've really ever had. She had seven surviving offspring. And it's been fun to follow this family in thinking about female dispersal. So her eldest daughter, Fanny, chose to remain in Casacala. So she was sort of the the second generation to remain. She was quite prolific. And so we can compare Fanny to her younger sister, Flossie, who dispersed to Matumba. And we're still following Flossie to this day. She's also had a string of infants herself. And then Flo's youngest daughter, Flirt, uh, dispersed much more recently in 2012. And she's sort of just starting her reproductive career. So this is just one family, but we have a lot of individuals like this at Gombe, where I can compare those that have dispersed to those that have stayed behind. So I use this to sort of work on this primary research hypothesis, and that is that dispersal in female chimpanzees is especially costly. As a result, dispersal is conditional and outcomes rely primarily on the opposing effects of kin cooperation and inbreeding risk. And so my work really up to this time has been really focused on teasing apart the different aspects of this hypothesis. So is how costly is dispersal and what does that mean for the decisions that females are making at maturity? First, I'd like to just show you guys um, what dispersal looks like going back to the 1960s. And I do this with the caveat that, that the environment has changed in Gombe um, over that time period. You know, we're now in our sixth decade of, re seventh decade, I suppose, of research. And when it first started in the 1960s, Jane Goodall used bananas to um, sort of habituate the community. And there was heavy banana feeding in the late, in, till the late 60s, but then they introduced a really regimented banana feeding regime where each individual really only got one banana a day, if that. And that lasted until the 
until 2000 <laughs> when it was stopped completely. So we're now on our second generation of chimpanzees who have never eaten a banana, but it's something to keep in mind when thinking about dispersal in Cassicala. Um, on the other hand, we've had a lot of changes in tree cover as well and sort of the, um, the habitat in the park and around the park was, you know, was quite, quite forested in the 60s and 70s. Then there was some rapid, um, uh, sorry, rapid deforestation in the 80s, uh, pretty bad in the 90s as we had the, the refugee crisis from conflict in Rwanda and Burundi into the early 2000s. And then more recently, there's been a, a good effort to do reforestation. And there's actually been some real success stories in that way. So two sort of, in some ways, opposing effects on dispersal. Um, sometimes they work in concert, sometimes they're working against each other. But what we see is remarkably consistent across the decades. The light green here are the number of females born into Cassicala that did not disperse, they remained philopatric, while the dark green is females born into Cassicala that did disperse. The hatched areas here, we had um, one female in the 70s, one female in the 80s that dispersed after giving birth in their home community. And this is really rare in chimpanzees. We only have two or three cases um, in our decades of observation. But really, if you average this out, you know, we had a little bit of a dip here in the 2010s with more dispersals than um, Philopatric females, but it really averages about 50%. And it's been fairly static through time. So females are dispersing. Some are dispersing, some are staying. So what might the cost be to each of these strategies? And what we've known from other field sites, including Gombe, is that maturing females that are leaving their home community, when they arrive in a new community, they are faced with hostile resident females. The females that are already there do not really want anything to do with new incoming females. Every additional body is going to increase scramble competition. It's going to um, potentially decrease their own reproductive success and make resources scarcer. So we see a lot of aggression towards these incoming females. Uh, this has been documented at many field sites. We have one female at Gombe, this, her name is Shweeney. She's been a, a poor, um, poor unfortunate female who tried many times to disperse from Casacala to Matumba and she was viciously attacked over eight hours on two separate instances and basically driven home. So in my dissertation research, I really wanted to quantify this and look at the amount of aggression that these immigrant females were getting both from resident males in a new community or in their adult community and from females. And I really importantly had this nice comparison group where I had natal females of similar age to compare to the immigrant females. I was able to control for sexual swelling status, for instance, um, as well as age and sort of condition there. And what we see is that there's not much difference in males. The males are attacking natal females and immigrant females in that community at near equal rates. But when we look at aggression from females, the immigrants are, at the receiving end of that aggression, almost two and a half times more frequently than our natal females. So this was a quite a significant difference for these natal females. So it seems to be coming directly from females themselves and is not from the males of the group, which makes sense. We've known that the incoming females are um, sort of sexually attractive to the resident males as well. So they often will actually protect these females. I'm sort of not surprising then knowing that they're getting beat up a lot. We see this bear out in our health data as well. We do health observation sheets on these animals going back to the uh, mid 2000s, I think. And if you look at natal females and immigrant females of similar age, here we see, I don't know, maybe a four, four time increase in the number of wounds that we're finding on immigrant females. Now, in these cases, we don't always know the origin of the wounds um, or who inflicted them. It's just an observation after the fact. Here we have a, a poor female named Flirt who immigrated, became emaciated. She has a giant chunk of her ear missing from a bad fight with resident females. Interestingly, when you look at the wound location, we see that many of these are on the anogenital region. So the sexual swelling, this is a good example here where we have a female, her sexual swelling should not look like this. <laughs> this teardrop at the bottom is weird. All this part is weird. And she's just sort of one example of this. Now there are, Many explanations for this. I haven't dived into this data um, quite yet, but there's you know quite complex explanations from potentially this being some kind of reproductive competition where other females are specifically going for the, the backside to um, perhaps diminish their reproductive chances. Or it could be quite simple, and it's just that 
you know, these females are fleeing attacks and that puts their sexual swelling and, and hind limbs the closest to the attacking um, perpetrator there. So this is something that's, that's sort of still in research phase, but I found interesting nonetheless. When you look at the social networks of immigrants versus natal females, we see um, really big shifts here in that dispersing females have a huge shift in their social network from being female centric with few strong bonds to being male centric with many weaker bonds. Immigrants are grooming with others less, and this is primarily due to a loss in female social partners, and they spend more time grooming alone. So we can see here, these are our natal philopatric females. They spend a lot of their time, about 4% of their time, um, in and out grooming with females, much less time grooming with adult males here. And we see a, sort of an opposite effect here with the immigrants. They're hardly grooming with adult females. They groom more with males, but still overall, you see that decrease, you know, if you were to add these bars together, we see less grooming overall in immigrants. And grooming is a really important affiliative behavior to chimpanzees. And so this could have, um, you know, could have health consequences, certainly has social consequences for these females. And perhaps the sort of really important piece of data here is that we see a later age at first birth in females that disperse than in females that remain philopatric. And this is a substantial difference of two and a half years, which is half an interbirth interval. And we know in chimpanzees that longevity is the main predictor of overall reproductive success. So you got to start early and you got to live a long time. So if you're already delaying your first birth by two and a half years, those philopatric females are gaining a, a very real advantage here uh, against the immigrant females. So age at first birth in um, natal females is somewhere around 13, whereas around immigrant females, it's closer to 15 and a half. Okay, so dispersal is really hard. Um, my data show that, other folks' data shows that. So why, um, and my collaborator and I sometimes wonder, you know, why do they, even go at all. <laughs> Why can't they all stay? They seem to have a cushy life when they do. But of course, sort of the flip side to this coin is the inbreeding risk. And I have really nice data that shows immigrant females. What we're looking at here is the general relatedness between every immigrant female and resident male in the community and every natal female and resident male in the community. And um, we have up here are more related individuals at the top down to unrelated individuals. And we see a, a significant shift in the mean. And if you look at the scatter, we have quite a few individuals up here. Um, these guys are related at the level of half siblings or above in many cases. So if you disperse, you're virtually eliminating the risk of inbreeding. So you're more related to those in your community. This is one of my favorite pictures to sort of um, look at this from the perspective of a female who chose to stay behind. Here is a non-dispersing female. This is Sweeney, the one who actually tried to disperse but didn't. And this is just an average afternoon um, where she's hanging out. She has two adult maternal brothers in the group, so she needs to avoid breeding with these two. Not pictured is her father who is still alive in the group. And if you cast an even wider net, this over here is her nephew. So she has really decreased her pool of available mates and needs to work to avoid these um, related individuals in her community. So definitely there's a chance to inbreed for sure, but how common is it? You know, Can they readily avoid it or is it something that's actually sort of costly to them? And what we found is that all females of known parentage had at least one male relative in the group at maturity with a median of three. So everybody who matures in the group is gonna have at least one male relative. Of those three relatives, one is likely to be maternal and two paternal. And this distinction is important because we see differences in behavior towards maternal brothers who are very easy to recognize. They all travel with mom. Um, they definitely seem to recognize one another as brothers and sisters versus paternal relatives which are harder to recognize. And indeed, when we look at mating, so do they mate with these relatives? The answer for paternal relatives is a resounding yes. We know that matings between maternal relatives are incredibly rare, so you don't see hardly any mother-son matings, hardly any maternal brother, maternal sister matings. But when you look at mating rates between paternal relatives and compare them to unrelated individuals, we see that they are mating with paternal brothers and fathers even more so than unrelated individuals. So matings are definitely happening. We also know due to our genetic information that conceptions do happen. 12% of offspring born to philopatric females are inbred. This at this point is five individuals. 
And okay, so it happens um, again, but how costly is it? Well, 75% um, of the inbred infants have died prior to maturity. So this is a, a very high infant mortality rate. And this is sort of in line with findings from other species that you, know, you get the accumulation of the deleterious alleles, something's happening with these inbred infants and they're not making it to maturity. Now, given that the average female can expect one to four offspring in her lifetime, wasting an investment on an, an inbred offspring that is highly likely to die is a pretty big energy sink. So it's a pretty bad idea for a female to do this. Then I'd also like to point out that even if you manage to avoid inbreeding, there's an expense of avoiding these matings. I have some cool data that shows that females are more likely to resist mating attempts from fathers and paternal brothers than they are from unrelated individuals. So the females are trying to avoid it, we think, um, but it, it seems to not be that successful for paternal relatives. Okay, so the inbreeding part is uh, a pretty big risk <laughs> to fill a patchery. So then why would you stay? What are the benefits? And what we find here is that females who stay have a really stable, strong social network, primarily with their female kin. We see that adult female kin maintain strong social bonds through association and grooming and usually share their core foraging areas. This is some really neat data here where we're looking at non-kin dyads compared to kin dyads. This is sort of their mean spatial overlap. So where are they foraging? You see that kin are foraging together, but then you see these even starker contrasts with just dyadic association and grooming. So kin dyads are hanging out together a lot compared to non-kin dyads who don't hang out together really at all. So if you're an immigrant female, you come in, you don't have any female kin. And so you aren't spending really any time forming any female relationships. You don't get any benefit from that. If you're not hanging out with males, you're probably alone. And that's not true for our mother-daughter pairs. They are spending their time grooming each other quite frequently, hanging out with one another. And there's a big benefit to this in terms of attaining an initial rank. So when females are maturing into the hierarchy, we see a big difference in where they join the hierarchy. Here we have, this is comparing natal females with a mother, natal females without a mother, and then immigrant females. So and this is their rank coming in. The higher number is a higher rank. We know that higher rank in females correlates to higher reproductive success. So it's, it's to a female's benefit to attain a high rank. We see that natal females are coming in at around rank five, whereas immigrant females are coming in at around rank one. Maybe they jump over one individual. So what this means is that natal females spend more of their life at a high rank, which presumably then is giving them a reproductive benefit. So if we sort of put this all into a, a nice little chart here, what are the costs and benefits? What are sort of the main takeaways from this research? For females that remain philopatric, those that stay behind, the big cost is that they're limiting their mate choice. They may only have three or four unrelated males in the group and they have to avoid inbreeding. They have to do those behaviors to not mate with their paternal and maternal relatives. But if they are successful in that, they have this really high degree of social consistency. They have the presence of kin. They can form coalitions with their mother or sisters if they have any. And all of this leads to an earlier age at first birth. Whereas those that go um, are going to encounter hostile females, they're going to have a really rough time of it for the first at least five years, my data is showing. Um, their first birth is going to be much later for these ladies. But the flip side of that is that they don't really have to worry about inbreeding at all. They have increased mate choice. Um, any male in the community is going to be acceptable um, as a mating partner. So who goes and who stays? Can we see evidence that individual females are sensitive to conditions at maturity? Um, the answer to this is a, a really cool yes. This is a paper I published just last year where we looked at sort of five factors that are commonly thought of to affect conditional dispersal. Uh, that would be sort of kin support. And in this case, we used mother's rank as sort of a, a proxy for that. Inbreeding risk. Um, for now, we're only able to look at weaned maternal brothers for inbreeding risk, although we have some data on paternal brothers as well. We looked at habitat quality. We looked at um, competition. So sort of, as I mentioned earlier in the dispersal theory literature, a lot of folks think that competition with kin might be important. So we looked at that as well. Um, and then we looked at mate choice, so sort of how many unrelated individuals are available. And no matter how you ran this model, there was sort of a, a resounding um, 
emphasis that only two things mattered. They mattered a lot and they mattered in opposite ways. Your mother's rank at maturity is highly predictive of remaining Philopatric in this case. So the higher your mother's rank here we're looking, the less likely you are to disperse. And an opposing force is the number of weaned maternal brothers that you have. Unsurprisingly, the more brothers that you have, the more likely you are to disperse. And this was a very robust result. You can see this is sort of every chimpanzee in our data set down here. We have these females with the, the dark red. These are those that remained Philopatric and had that high ranking mother. So we can see that um, eight of our females out of uh, what, 12 or 13 that remained Philopatric had that high ranking mother. Many, most with no brothers. So they didn't have to worry about that um, inbreeding component. So they sort of had the, a very cushy choice here to make. So what sort of the conclusions here, dispersal is costly, but prevents those costs associated with inbreeding, both the mating aspect and the conception aspect of inbreeding. And under certain conditions, females can and do remain philopatric. And I think that this is not something unique to Gombe. Uh, I think that this is something that we'll find at other field sites. There's a, a very large chimpanzee community in Ngogo in Uganda where they're seeing more and more females remaining philopatric. If we were to look at it there, I think we would see very similar patterns, uh, similarly at other field sites as well. And here I just wanna sort of highlight the importance of opposing trade-offs in the evolution of dispersal. It's not always just one thing, you know, it's not always just inbreeding risk. You can have something sort of um, on one side, keeping females in a community, and then on the other side, sort of pushing females out of a community. So this just highlights that in chimpanzees for females, um, dispersal isn't this sort of innate thing, everybody goes, rather I believe it to be conditional and females will make the choice um, based on, on their own circumstances. There are conservation implications to this that I wanted to just end on in that, um, as we're all aware, fragmented populations are at risk of inbreeding. We've looked at this in our genetic data at Gombe. We don't yet see a problem. We have high genetic diversity, but it's certainly something to be aware of in the years to come. So far, our inbred conceptions have all died, so they sort of have not themselves gone on to reproduce, um, but it's something that we're definitely aware of. And it sort of highlights the, the necessity of dispersal corridors. We wanna maintain that as an option for females. Uh, I think if, as habitats do shrink, you are gonna see more philopatry in females. And I just wanted to sort of highlight this cool program at Gombe where in, by the 2000s, um, Jane Goodall and, and others at the Jane Goodall Institute and the Tanzanian government had really realized that the situation was pretty dire around Gombe. It was really a forested island. This is the park right here. It's a small park. The chimpanzees were at risk. Um, they're a big moneymaker for Tanzania. Um, so everybody was interested in saving them. So they worked together, formed a, a really cool group that um, worked with the villages north of the park. Each area here is a village and sort of helped them with land use planning. And they all agreed that they would establish forest reserves at the highest elevations. And they have forest monitors that go up there and make sure that that they're being looked after, there's no illegal cutting going on. And what they've done is established a corridor now that goes to the Burundi border up here where there's more heavily forested areas and larger chimp populations that now connects to Gombe National Park here. And it is working in the last, in the 2010s, we've had three females that came from areas up north into the park. And we've been able to, we certainly know they came from outside the park via the genetic information. And um, we've done some, genetics on chimps that we've seen up in this area and sort of preliminary data suggests that those chimps came from this area. So it's sort of a really cool story. And you can see some of the reforestation going on from Gombe in the 90s to Gombe in the 2010s. You see a lot more tree growth on some of these hillsides here. So with that, um, there's a huge, huge group behind this work um, going back to 1960. Um, all my collaborators here and the staff at Gombe are very um, essential to this work. Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Uh, I had no idea the amount of uh, females that stayed. I'm shocked. I knew there was a few, but that's really a substantial number. 
Yeah, it's and it's not just at Gombe, it seems to be everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Do you know also, do they, uh, when when the females do leave, do they leave alone or do they leave with a friend in a group or? They usually go alone. Um, it can be hard to keep track of females because they are often alone and you know, it's heavily forested with the fission fusion society. Sometimes you just realize you haven't seen a female in a couple months um, and then she might pop up in another community and then she'll show up there more regularly. But there's no no real evidence that they go in pairs. It's pretty much always alone. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me let me look into the um, the um, the question. Unless somebody's got one that they want to shout out before I go to the chat room. No, I think we're okay. All right. So one is from Eric. He wants to know if maybe I guess you should call it a uh, uh, fellow matrix rather than fellow Patrick. <laughs> That they were staying, that they were staying in their group. Moms. Yeah, I suppose the females might be phylometric in that case. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another one is uh, curious. It's private, but I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, is homosexual behavior seen in chimps, and is it tolerated? Um, that's a good question. It's very different from bonobos, um, which many of you are probably familiar with, where that's just a regular occurrence in life. Um, between females, it's incredibly rare on very very rare occasions you might see two females kind of put their backsides together they don't mount each other um it's really it doesn't really happen between females um between males you sometimes see mounting you see um ball cupping they sort of grab each other's testicles that are hanging down there but it's still it's not quite as common even as you know in some macaque species for instance um but it's a little bit more common in males and it's virtually non-existent in females. Okay. Uh, next is, do native females uh, protest their mating by male relatives? Do they call out, for example, to get others to break up a sexual encounter with the relative? Often, yes. We see pretty, um, a lot of resistance from females, especially if it's maternal relatives, they really want nothing to do with that. They will scream, they'll run away, they'll do everything that they can to resist. Um, the data shows that it does also happen um, with paternal relatives, which is interesting. Um, we sort of have a lot of a lot of lines of evidence that they can maybe probably identify their paternal relatives, <laughs> but it's sort of it's not definitive quite yet. Um, and they certainly treat them differently if they can from maternal brothers. Um, but they do seem to to want to avoid mating with maternal relatives for sure. And there's not a lot of um, the male relatives don't show much interest in their maternal sisters. Um, it's very different with fathers. We've had some pretty strange cases where fathers really go after their daughters. Um, and that's something we're still puzzling over. Um, but they definitely seem to resist with maternal relatives. OK. Uh, it's OK. And then uh, in terms of numbers, are there more females or males in any given group? Yeah, I, I should have had that in the, the first part. <laughs> in a uh, chimp community, there are usually more females, uh, at least twice as many uh, females to males. Um, in Casa Kayla, the big community, we have anywhere up to about 25 females and usually around 10 males. Um, so almost always a substantial number of females compared to males. Does the, does the size of the group, do you think, influence whether females uh, may stay or not? I mean, because they would, if the group is really large, there might be potentially more males that they're not related to or something. Yeah, like. and that's something that was sort of on my mind thinking about the sort of just the raw number of unrelated males that I put into my model thinking about who went and who didn't go. And that didn't come out in my particular model. Um, the Casa group with 60 individuals, you know, you have 10 males, you might be related to four or five of them. That still gives you a, probably an adequate number of unrelated males. Um, sort of contrast that to the Matumba community, which is smaller. They only have five males um, total. So mm -hmm. if you're related to three of them, now you've shrunk it down to two. <laughs> so I think that could matter. The Ngogo community in Uganda, which is the largest um, known chimpanzee community, um, pushing upwards of, I think it's over 200 by now. Um, they, they seem to be getting more and more Philopatric females. And so again, group size could definitely matter in that case. So I, it's, I think it's something to keep in mind, yes. Yeah. Also, I know I'm, I'm hogging the question, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> so how, how long, I mean, do, do females travel like great distances? I mean, you showed the, just along the Lake 
uh, Tanganyika, you know, that range, but do they, do they go really far away to uh, find a new? <laughs> I would love to have a really good answer to that question. Um, we have documented cases in our community where they go up, we think about 12 or 13 kilometers. Um, so we're not talking about, you know, dozens of kilometers. Right. Um, yeah. We certainly know they seem to prefer just going to adjacent communities. Um, that's also some findings from other communities. There's some really cool genetic work going on in Uganda at the Kibali site and others that is um, looking at just through fecal samples or sort of the distance females are traveling. And they're getting some that are traveling quite a, quite a distance. Um, it looks, they shop around. This is something I didn't even mention. Dispersing oh. females will visit other communities before settling permanently. And at Gombe, we've seen females like in a tree in a local village <laughs> at, you know, at the right age at about 13, they'll be like, hey, we saw this little female. Do you guys wanna come see who she is? And we'll go down there and be like, whoa, that's, you know, that's flower. <laughs> and then later on that female that I'm thinking of in this example later ended up transferring to the Matumba community. Um, so, so that certainly happens. So they're certainly traveling tens of kilometers, whether they're traveling above that, I can't say in, in our community, but possibly. I mean, that's pretty risky, don't you think? I mean, because you're a female alone? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And to go out into these agricultural village lands, most definitely. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it sort of floored us in some cases that these things are happening. But um, I, I dream of putting GPS trackers on these chimps, but I, I'm not there yet. Not allowed. <laughs> not allowed, I don't think. <laughs> Well, we've tried it with the right test. There's nowhere to put like a collar. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so it's really, uh, you don't want to do that anyway, poor thing. You know? Right, right. I want to like st just stick a little Velcro thing on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, okay, that was great. Thank you so much, Karen. Any other questions before we move on? No, we seem to be good. Okay. All right, Chris, take it away. Is he there? Chris? Uh, he's here. Okay. I can hear him in the other room. Okay. <laughs> Give him on one mute. second. On our end, he's on mute. So maybe that's. Uh... Oh, I think he's getting it. Okay. Ah. There he is. There he is. There we go. Okay, great. The window got minimized so small that I couldn't see it. I could hear everybody, but I was confused. We're this late into the day and I'm still getting confused. <laughs> Okay, give me just a moment here. Figure out how to uh, dig in the window. Nope, nope. There we go. Okay. As everyone leaves. No, we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, I too am a bit rusty, but I can't claim the same excuse that Kara did. <laughs> um, so I'll try to think of some other excuse as we as we go along. Um, okay. Got that, make sure it's the right one. Okay. And share screen. I have multiple screens going here right. and that yeah, tends to be to... more more problematic than anything else. Yeah, you have to just click on the one the screen that you want to share on your uh, on your on the face of your computer screen and then click share. Put it over here that way I am looking at y'all. Ah, yes, it's happening. There we go. It is happening. <laughs> We'll see if that works. Probably not. Well, maybe. Okay. So I can see people and you can see the screen and I think all is well in the world and the internet has not given out yet. <laughs> Ever since we upgraded to gigabit internet, it seems like we've been having more issues. So, uh, well, thank everyone. Thank everyone. Thank you all for uh, uh, staying around uh, for uh, this talk, uh, which as was credited on the uh, on the announcement as being about bonobos, and Eric, I actually appreciate that that uh, 
it was fairly left fairly generic. Obviously, I told you I was going to incorporate bonobos because it gave a lot of flexibility uh, as, uh, as we was building this because it kind of shifted a bit as I was as I was going throughout and trying to figure out how to tie a common thread uh, throughout uh, all of my studies on bonobos. I'm going to move everyone over here. They're now I'm actually looking at you. And um, ultimately, I came to the conclusion that I'm not a primatologist. I'm a hominin paleontologist. And no matter how hard I try, I kept pulling it back to, to that topic. So there are bonobos. I'm not totally defrauding everybody. I will deliver on bonobos as, as I promised. But because uh, at least some of the more interesting things I have to share recently are uh, related to, um, well, I've been calling them recent hominin finds now for four or five years. So maybe they're not recent anymore. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of, of hominin paleontology stuff, and then I will bridge in and end on uh, bonobos. Now we're not shifting. Come on, we can do it. Here we go. Change. OK. So just a, a bit of a of a refresher for those of you who have uh, not thought about uh, our hominin ancestors for, for a while. Uh, most of the, most of the uh, hominin fossil sites, uh, particularly the pre-human, pre-Neanderthal fossil sites are concentrated in two areas in Africa. There are the sites in East Africa, in the uh, Great Rift Valley, or more accurately known as the East African Rift. This is an area of tectonic divergence where the plates are actively uh, spreading apart from each other. And it extends uh, from uh, Malawi and Mozambique all the way up actually into Asia in Lebanon and a uh, number of famous fossil specimens. Uh, probably everyone listening has heard of uh, Lucy, unless they are of a, a certain young age and has not studied it yet. Uh, she came from, from Ethiopia. And uh, the number of dots here is by no means representative of the number of fossil sites. There's many fossil sites here. Um, and there's also some other sites around Africa. Sahelanthropus chadensis is found in Chad but majority here and uh, with the uh, majority of the remaining fossil sites being located in South Africa. And uh, the formation of the sites and how the fossils came to be fossilized is very, very different uh, in these two areas. Uh, in uh, South Africa, you find primarily dolomite caves. So water is getting into the dolomite and it's creating cracks and fissures and opening up what in places are cavernous, uh, expansive cave systems. And oftentimes the fossils are in uh, a natural breccia, uh, which is like a, well, kind of a natural concrete is what I meant to say, um, called breccia as opposed to in East Africa, the sediments are a little bit um, softer. They're a little bit easier to, to get out, um, but they're also generally um, a little bit more spread out at the fossil sites as well. So uh, many, uh, many researchers in paleontology, since it is historically known as a, uh, what's the word I should use here? Um, uh, egotistical, maybe that's, wrong. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of disagreements in paleoanthropology and a lot of uh, disagreements lead to isolation of uh, groups. Um, and while there these days are more people working in more areas across uh, the world and studying hominin fossils, uh, you still generally see some people as East African or South African has more to do about where they primarily work and less to do with what their beliefs are. I think the past generation may, may have uh, more uh, beliefs tied to location. Uh, but in any case, I'm, I would be classified as a, as a South African uh, paleoanthropologist, hominin paleontologist. 
Um, although I would love to visit all of the East African sites, I've not extended beyond the museums. So the majority of those South African sites are in what's called the cradle of humankind, uh, not to be confused with the East African, uh, Kenyan, or Tan Tanzanian site, uh, which is the cradle of mankind, unless they've uh, officially changed that given uh, that mankind is um, clearly out of favor. Um, so the cradle of humankind is uh, an area about 30, 30 miles northwest of Johannesburg. Uh, and it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site home to well over a dozen uh, fossil hominin bearing sites that include uh, species from Australopithecus africanus to uh, Paranthropus or Australopithecus robustus. There's uh, Homo sapiens in there uh, and a couple others that I'll talk about um, in the coming slides. So over roughly half of the, uh, the world's uh, early hominin fossils, not counting modern humans and early uh, modern humans come from the cradle of humankind. And the two sites I'm gonna talk about that I've worked primarily at in recent years are Malapa and Rising Star. So the uh, site of Malapa is where a species that came to be known as Australopithecus sediba was discovered. And uh, while this picture turned out a little blurry on my screen, hopefully it's uh, less so on, on yours. Um, it's a bit unique amongst sites in the, in the area because while it once was a cave, it is no longer. And uh, it was uh, over time and also with a little push from uh, miners looking for limestone uh, back over a hundred years ago, it was essentially destroyed. And um, the fossils that Sediba was found in were um, at least initially, the initial fossils were found in blocks that had been destroyed with dynamite and they were way off uh, to the side away from the site. So this is the site of Malapa and it's now covered uh, with a giant structure that, that both protects and facilitates uh, excavations. So uh, two million years ago when the species Sediba, or at least when those fossils uh, came to be in there, uh, it was a much deeper cave and it's believed that the uh, individuals probably fell in based on, on some of the uh, evidence on the fossils themselves. So uh, Sediba was found uh, in 2008 uh, by Matthew Berger. And uh, I'm not gonna spend much time talking about Sediba. One of the reasons I included is because uh, we just, got, uh, just saw on Twitter the other day that Matthew graduated from the University of Alabama and uh, is going to uh, film school at USC. So I, I don't generally think of myself as old, but it was these fossils that really started my graduate career. Uh, so I think that this little boy is now uh, graduated from college. And um, here in the middle, this is the type specimen for the species. It's uh, MH1. It's a juvenile male, probably around 11, 12 years old in, in human terms. And uh, Matthew's father, Lee Berger, is the uh, uh, paleontologist who actually led the study and um, on paper is the discoverer. Um, actually, as a brief aside, at the time, uh, he tried to get Matthew on the science paper announcing the species and science editors would not let uh, a a nine-year-old boy uh, be on the paper. They did not feel that um, finding the specimen was uh, contribution enough, I guess. Oh, that's really blurry. This all looked great before. Um, so uh, with, with uh, the discovery of Sediba, uh, which for Lee came after decades of finding very, very little in the cradle of humankind. He had been there since the early 90s, having worked with a, a prominent paleontologist named Philip Tobias. Um, until 2008, he, he hadn't found anything significant in the way of hominin fossils. 
Um, and with Sadiba came a lot of money. And with that money, he came out, he started sending out uh, teams in search of more fossils, uh, particularly more hominin fossils. And the uh, thought amongst some uh, in the field of paleoanthropology, of hominin paleontology, was that the cradle of humankind had been explored. Uh, and that for that matter, many hominin paleontologists felt that by the 2000s, all fossils that could be discovered and were worth discovering had already been discovered. Um, and Lee obviously felt differently. He had reason to, given that he had a major discovery that had just been under the nose of so many um, before him. And ultimately that, that led to the discovery of the rising star cave system um, back in 2013-14. So I keep on the wrong screen here. So the, uh, the rising star cave system is one of those expansive uh, caves or cave systems that I mentioned before, um, composed of dolomite. The entrance is seen here on the right. Um, now it is all gated up and much more secure than it was back at the uh, time of initial discovery. And uh, the fossils at the site and the fossil site itself were discovered by uh, these two gentlemen on the left here, Steve Tucker and Rick Hunter. And who I have labeled as Marina Elliott is not Marina Elliott. That is Ellen uh, Fury Goal. Uh, apologies to Ellen if uh, this happens to get back to her. Um, and uh, Ellen was one of the uh, uh, archaeologists, excavators on the site as well. So I think it's fair to label her as discoverer as well. But Steve and Rick had no formal training in paleontology, archaeology, anything of the sort. Uh, they were spelunkers, cavers, and they had been exploring the, uh, the cave mostly for fun. They had been, uh, in a sense, working uh, under Lee Berger. He had asked them uh, via proxy to keep an eye out for, for human-like remains as they uh, were going around these caves in the area. But they didn't really have any formal experience. And they didn't really specify anything in the Rising Star Cave system because it was used as the training site for the local caving society. So it was one of the most explored, uh, so they thought, cave systems in the, in the region. And um, I don't actually know where the entrance that you see on the right is here in the middle, but on this, this figure in the middle, all of the gray shaded area, I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor or not, uh, that is the, the open parts of the cave system itself. And where they came to find fossils was here uh, labeled the Dinaletti chamber. And here on the left is a uh, 2D reconstruction of 3D scans of the inside of the cave system as it goes from the entrance that we just saw all the way down to uh, the Dinaletti chamber, which is where the fossils are found. So it's about an 80 meter uh, span from entrance to fossil chamber, and it's about 30 meters from ground level there. And as you can tell from some of these areas, again, the gray is, uh, is the open area of the cave system. A um, couple areas are quite small. Superman's crawl is, is um, a tight squeeze. Uh, many people have gotten stuck in Superman's crawl. Um, and the chute which is a 10 meter drop or 10, 12 meter drop uh, down from an area called the Dragon's Back into the fossil chamber is so narrow in places, about seven inches wide uh, at its narrowest extent that they couldn't even get the scanner down it to scan, which is why it's just a, a um, dash line here. And uh, the photo on the right is a shot uh, photograph looking down the, uh, the chute, so you can get a sense of, of how, how tight it is. Oops, wrong way. <laughs> and it is, um, 
it's this area, the Ginaletti chamber in the chute that had been not been discovered at the time that Rick and Steve um, found this area. They had been at the top of the dragon's back and um, evidently one of them said, hey, there's a hole back here, let's see where it goes, not knowing whether it was you know, a couple meters down or a plummet to their death. And uh, luckily it was not a plummet to their death and they went down, snapped some photos and um, ultimately found some some fossils. So this was the short version of of what usually is an hour long talk about all this this stuff anyway. And I uh, I had omitted the video at first in the interest interest of time, but I hope it plays because more so than that photo, this uh, little clip I have here, it's very dark, but it does give a sense of how tight some of these squeezes are. So this is uh, someone going through the Superman's crawl uh, part of the cave system. It's called the Superman crawl because most people go through head first with an arm out like Superman flying. Clearly not the case here. But this is as far as I have gone. And I, I don't know if I would have been allowed to go beyond that given my lack of training, but I don't think I would have wanted to either. Well, actually, I know. I, uh, I wouldn't want to. Um, much easier when the fossils are brought out to you. <laughs> uh, so here's what uh, came out of the, uh, the cave chamber, the Dinaliti chamber after the initial excavation. So going into it, it was National Geographic funded. The expectation is that there was probably a hominin, they're pretty confident it was a hom hominin, probably Australopithecus africanus, which is fairly common in the area. Um, and they had enough, they had budget enough time and money to, to excavate, um, you know, maybe one partial skeleton. And they knew it was gonna be difficult given how deep into the system it was. Um, but it didn't take long before they filled up the first safe and when um, bone after bone, you know, replicating the same uh, bone and side started coming out, it was clear that there were multiple individuals. So this is a, a composite um, individual. There were 1,550 uh, individual bone fragments of varying quality um, and completeness that were pulled out that initial excavation. Most of them were surface finds in the cave chamber, and they only actually uh, dug, excavated an area about the size of a manhole cover and about 10 centimeters deep. So since then, a lot more has, has come out of the Dinaliti chamber. Um, but even with just surface finds in that small area of excavation, it was the largest fossil hominin assemblage in Africa. And since then, since everything else has been um, excavated in the meantime, it's now the largest in the world. And at the time it, it had doubled the, um, the sample size in, in um, Africa. And here on the right is a, a artist reconstruction of, of what became known as Homo Naledi. And uh, a very, very basic overview of some of the um, initial findings. So a group of uh, almost 50 scientists from around the world of which I was part, oh, I'm really struggling with this today. Um, flew out to South Africa and we had a five, six week workshop where we all got together and, and divvied up into teams and studied all of those remains because it was really unprecedented. Both the workshop was unprecedented, but having that many fossils in such short of a time was unprecedented. Um, so out of those uh, initial uh, studies, the body mass of individuals in that assemblage was estimated between 90 and 120 pounds. Um, that was based on uh, primarily joint size, dimensions, femoral head diameter, um, which is not ideal for reasons I, I might have a chance to get to later. 
Um, there was one long bone, a tibia, that was that was complete enough to estimate stature, at least from that one bone. And uh, that individual was believed to have been around four foot, 10 inches. There was hardly any uh, size dimorphism within the sample. So unless all of the individuals, and I'll get to the number momentarily, um, but it was, it was quite a few, unless they all were, were female or male, uh, there was low sexual dimorphism. Um, interesting to us at the time, and, and still really don't, not sure why exactly, the limbs, upper limb and lower limb, uh, get progressively more primitive as you move proximally. So the hands are, are fairly human-like uh, in many respects, and they do have some curved fingers. Um, but other than that, there's a lot of features that are, that are found um, otherwise only in humans and Neanderthals. Some of the feet uh, in some ways are, are so, um, they're so much like a human that if they were found in isolation, um, many have argued that you could make a strong case that they are Homo sapien, uh, Homo sapiens feet. But as you get toward the shoulder, the shoulder is gibbon-like in some ways and um, chimpanzee-like in other ways. Um, certainly overall, it's, it's most like a, an Australopith. Um, similarly, the hip is very Australopithecus-like. The uh, long bones in general around the body, they're all very gracile, um, which I think is partly what gave the artist the um, plan here to go for a very long, lanky, gracile build in the reconstruction. Uh, cranial capacity, brain size was variably low, um, about the size of a, of a chimp. Small teeth, which is more of a homo-like feature. Uh, at the time of discovery, there was not a date. And um, there were a couple of studies and a lot of um, paleoanthropologists both on the team and off who speculated that these remains might be upwards of two, 2.5 million years old based on, on their anatomy and their morphology. Um, so it was quite a surprise a few years later when the date um, through multiple methods and multiple labs came out to be only about two to 300,000 years old. And then also since that initial discovery, there have been multiple other fossil sites within that cave system and all of the other um, fossils have been, uh, all the other hominin fossils have been um, homo naledi, clearly homo naledi, very little um, variation in their anatomy. And uh, still perplexing is that um, those uh, initial batch of fossils found in the Dinaliti chamber, 80 meters into the uh, cave system, uh, they were they were found without really any other animal remains. And that's pretty rare in the, in the region. There was a bit of a bird and a bit of a rodent, but they are both clearly um, much more recent. And the geologists still believe that the way that you get into the cave system today is still um, the, way, the way you would have gotten into it for um, more than a million years past. So how they came to be in that uh, deep dark chamber well into the dark zone where mammals typically do not go unless they have fire is um, still an unknown, although there's been lots of speculation that I, I won't get into um, now, even though it's many, that's the most interesting part. Um, and uh, the other fossil sites that have had Naledi do have some animal remains in them, but there's reasons potentially behind that, like. Uh, water movement and, and whatnot. So here's what I failed to do. So here's just some images of long bones, all fairly gracile, but they do have big muscle markings on them. Fairly human-like hand, curved fingers though. And there is uh, the most complete uh, cranial reconstruction of Naledi with a silhouette of a modern human. Um, what I did not say before, the number of, of individuals, um, 
and based on dental remains that uh, was 15. So 15, at least 15 individuals. Um, there were uh, eight adults, five uh, juvenile immature specimens, individuals, non-adults, and two that were unknown. Um, and so in all likelihood, there are actually more than 15. And when you add in all of the other individuals and fossils that have been covered to date, I'm not actually 100% sure what the number is, but um, doing math in my head, I think we're well north of 20, uh, probably coming up on 25 um, individuals. And uh, so that was a, it was a wealth of uh, hominid fossils that were once described as, as one of the uh, rarest items on, on Earth. Um, now there's far more hominin fossils than we have people to study them. And there's things that are just sitting there in the, in the safe, in the vault, unstudied for, for years. Um, and you'd think that with all those hundreds of fossils that it would answer lots of questions. Um, but as seems to be the case, at least in recent years with big discoveries in the field, uh, there's been more questions uh, raised by these new discoveries than there were um, questions answered. So for instance, we still know um, very little uh, about the phylogenetic relationships of Homo naledi, who uh, naledi is related to. Um, as I touched on earlier, how did it get so far into the cave, especially in this case of the Dean naledi chamber? Um, where else might this species have lived? So the age at which those fossils uh, from the Dean naledi chamber are they're living at a time close to when we have the earliest evidence of Homo sapiens. Neanderthals were in Europe. There were other um, uh, individuals belonging to genus Homo around Africa. Um, but we only have Homo naledi from this one site, still the rising star cave chamber. Um, I had question marks for some of those uh, features and uh, one of them was size listed in the slide previous. And that's because those estimates were based on pretty, pretty scanty evidence and uh, scant evidence, and um, the methods are are questionable as well. And um, I worked with the people who who did that. I was involved with it, and it was really the best that could be done at the time. Um, but I think that there's still a lot of work to be done there. And body size, body mass, in particular, is probably one of the single most important variables in uh, hominin paleontology, in really in paleontology and in many other fields of biology because of how many other important uh, traits, variables it is related to from physiology to uh, behavior and so on. Um, and then of personal interest to me, one thing I did not mention specifically, but going along with the uh, gracile long bones, um, are uh, the size of the joints. And we don't have a ton of preserved joint surfaces in that assemblage, but the ones that we do have are so tiny that they are, they're literally off the charts. There's nothing else, uh, there's no other primate like them. Uh, they're as different from uh, a human as a human is from a gorilla. Um, and humans have much smaller joints relative to bone length than do gorillas. So uh, it, it seems it's biomechanically perplexing, uh, but making things even more difficult to answer, the best, most complete specimens we have are uh, from immature individuals. So we really need to learn something about the way this species uh, developed to really make any definitive claims about anything else that very well could have changed um, as it matured. Okay, so that takes me more now to uh, a transition to, to bonobos where I, I'll fizzle out because we get to, um, to areas that I am less and less familiar with. Um, but luckily I know we have other experts uh, um, here in the in the room who can answer any tough questions and maybe thrown my way, um, particularly when we get to bonobo behavior, which I'll skip over. <laughs> so uh, 
Um, despite what hominin paleontologists in particular would like to uh, believe, fossils are, are not the end all be all of, of our field of biological anthropology, of human evolution. They don't hold all the answers. Um, but you know they are obviously a, a useful uh, tool and they provide objective data, but pretty much, well, I shouldn't say pretty much every, but, but many, many uh, hominin paleontological studies at this point involve some comparative analyses, even at the initial stages of fossil description. Uh, and this would be the, the top down versus bottom up approach. So, so the fossils are, are the bottom up, top down, looking at living species to uh, provide um, the uh, information needed to create testable hypotheses that those fossils can be used to test, uh, to provide genetic data. Um, and in hominin paleontology, because uh, of the phylogenetic relationships for, um, whoops, oh, I forgot one thing there. I'm glad I accidentally clicked that. Because uh, genetic uh, evidence has, um, in my opinion, resolved the relationships uh, amongst the African apes. And we now know uh, pretty well that uh, Homo and Pan are a monophyletic group. Um, the most commonly used uh, comparative species are chimpanzees, bonobos, comprising Pan, and to a slightly lesser extent, uh, gorillas. So um, this is comparative data, everything from, from behavior to, in my case, I'm most commonly using them as uh, uh, comparisons uh, morphologically. And this also uh, goes along with modern humans as well. Um, now for practical reasons that me here probably can guess if they don't know, I did it again, I don't know what's happening. I think, I think my computer is telling me I need to go faster. <laughs> I am over on time, but I'm almost, uh, I'm almost done as well. You're good, you're good, don't worry. So uh, for practical reasons, including the fact that, well, there are fewer bonobos than chimpanzees. Uh, there's fewer field sites. Those field sites are shorter. Um, the remains of bonobos are harder to come by. Um, there's just overall less known uh, about bonobos. And that's, I think, more so true uh, on the morphology side uh, in particular. And uh, at least with behavior, um, long-term studies uh, are, are still um, needed. And so, there we go. So that takes me to, to the bonobos. I apologize if things are going haywire. I have the rainbow spinning wheel of death uh, on my Mac here. Um, now in, in my work recently, uh, starting a few years ago, uh, bonobos started playing a larger uh, role for the top-down group, for the comparative specimens. Um, largely because opportunistically because they got access um, and and I got very very lucky as as a result um, but just to uh, bring everyone up to speed I think this is something that probably most uh, already know but just in case uh, we don't uh, bonobos um, I guess they don't always look as different from chimpanzees as, as this uh, artist has them uh, um, shown here, that must be a, a juvenile chimp on the on the left here, perhaps. Um, but they are morphologically different, um, at least to a, some degree. Bonobos are slightly smaller, both in terms of stature and in terms of body mass. Um, that body mass difference is, on average, uh, much more uh, much larger than the stature difference. They might be a, a inch or so different both males and females from uh, chimpanzee counterparts, whereas it's 15 to 30 kilos for, for body mass in some cases. 
Uh, bonobos also have longer uh, hind limbs and more massive hind limbs. Um, and they also have longer torsos, at least there's some evidence suggests that it's, it's a, um, there's less data showing that. Um, but in other regions of the body, like the arm, forearm, um, head, chimpanzees are um, longer or larger. Um, and uh, overall, bonobos are both in terms of morphology and behavior often described as um, being juvenile or the juvenilization of bonobos. Um, and, and there's a fair bit of evidence that has demonstrated that over the years, a number of ontogenetic studies that have, have shown some uh, potential delay or lengthening of, of development that could lead to some of these more juvenile-like um, features. But again, overall, um, at least with respect to morphology, um, there's way more similarities than there are uh, differences. I think with behavior, um, that those differences become much more uh, notable behavior and cognition. Uh, 1.5 to 2 million years is, is the, uh, the best date I could find. I might be, uh, not have used the most recent reference for that. Um, in terms of the divergence of uh, these two pan species um, due to uh, the Congo River. So the bonobos got caught on the left bank and are isolated to that area um, in what is now the um, Democratic Republic of the Congo primarily. Um, I don't know, do they uh, extend west of that as well? Can't tell from my map I chose. Uh, in any case, the bonobos that I have used in uh, my morphological studies and in a growth study I'll, I'll share um, closing out here are all from uh, Lola Ya Bonobo, which is uh, the um, only, as far as I know, sanctuary, bonobo sanctuary uh, in the world. It was founded in its current location by Claudine Andre in 2002. Yeah. And it is just outside of Kinshasa. They have uh, between 60 and 70 bonobos. It varies. And starting in 2009, they started a program reintroducing some of uh, the bonobos back into the wild and have successfully released 30 uh, since then. There's three different uh, enclosures and two of them especially are quite large. So, uh, Oftentimes, these bonobos are referred to as semi-free ranging. They do have uh, um, quite a span, and they are in mixed sex, mixed age social groups as well. So um, not quite a zoo, not quite wild, obviously. Um, don't have time to get into the, um, the uh, implications of all of that, um, but that is certainly a consideration um, as well for studies that use data from these different sites. Now, uh, the data that I uh, initially got was for a study on body mass prediction equations. And um, I'll have a brief slide on that uh, quickly. But it all came as part of a routine um, vet check. Happens every, every year, at least um, they tried to do it every year. Um, sometimes twice a year, actually. And there were multiple, multiple samples taken, urine, blood, and external measurements taken, including body mass, stature, and biliac breadth. Um, stature, heel to crown. I'm, I don't know what I'm touching. <laughs> oh, every time it happens, the spinning wheel goes off. And now I'm going too far. Biliac breadth is, is the uh, measure of hip breadth. Um, and I might have that abbreviated as BIB somewhere else. There were 56 uh, individuals we have data from ranging, ranging from two to 32 years old. We split them into three groups, juvenile, subadult, and adult, based on uh, juvenile to subadult uh, is the age at uh, first menstruation in females, uh, and subadult adult is the age at which uh, growth, somatic growth ceases, um, at least from what we could find in literature. And uh, two 
my knowledge and my collaborators' knowledge, while there have been a number of ontogenetic studies looking at bonobo development, um, there aren't any growth curves out there that actually uh, incorporate body mass or any other um, measures from um, living bonobos. They're all inferred from osteological remains um, or, or something else. So even though this was not the primary purpose, uh, we realized with these data that we're using for something else that we could, we could look at, um, at these growth curves. And um, here, the dashed lines of the bonobos, the solid lines are, are humans, with uh, green being male and the uh, lavender is female. And uh, I think the what are called pseudo-velocity plots here on the right are the more informational. And what we're looking for is, is the peaks, because where the velocity increases, uh, that is essentially a growth spurt. And uh, the human adolescent growth spurt is, is well established. Um, and uh, over the years, it's become known that primate, that humans are not unique in, in that growth spurt. There are other primates that have exhibited a growth spurt, particularly in, in body mass. So it was not a big surprise that um, both male and female bonobos showed some growth spurt. Um, now these are cross-sectional data. We did not um, have the luxury of uh, collecting these measures for multiple years on, on these bonobos. Um, it can be a bit more difficult to find uh, growth spurts in cross-sectional data. And I obviously did not get into the human data at all. Um, but the fact that we spotted it, it makes us pretty confident that artifact, not to mention this, um, this does uh, support previous findings or on in bonobos as well. Um, I'm going to skip over this at the time because we're, I'm running over on time. This was the body mass uh, prediction study that we initially collected these data for. This was the real connection to, to the hominin fossils more than anything else, uh, because the prediction equations that had been used before required extrapolation. We wanted to test and see how these equations did on a sample that is um, unlike modern humans, like so many of the fossil hominins are. Um, so that was the, the short version. There was a series of papers. And, uh, and as I mentioned at the end in my bad job of skipping over, um, we found that a equation incorporating just one variable, bi-iliac breadth, was the most accurate in predicting um, bonobo body mass. Um, so that, that was uh, perplexing uh, as well. Stature seems like a very important um, variable uh, that would play into that, um, but it's not, um, at least in, in that study. And then two more uh, plots. We have stature here. And in stature, we have the growth spurt in humans, again, as you can see here in the solid lines. And uh, there is uh, not much of anything uh, in, in the bonobos. Uh, this little increase here, hardly a growth spurt. So we say no such uh, growth spurt in, in uh, stature. That's not surprising either, a very few species, uh, anyone has argued, has a gross burton stature. What is more surprising is hip breadth, bioleg breadth. Um, we see it in humans again, a growth spurt in the adolescent period. And there is a very clear growth spurt in male bonobos, but not female bonobos. So uh, one reason I incorporated this and in, in, uh, chose to talk about this, because this is a paper where we're working on uh, now, and I thought this would uh, help me to uh, um, get things uh, published quicker. Um, but unfortunately, at this age, I, I still we still do not know what what exactly uh, uh, we don't have an explanation uh, for for this. Um, and uh, so, if anyone does, uh, please let me know the uh, the answer. What your ideas uh, might be. So. Just to summarize all of that, we have evidence of an adolescent growth spurt in body mass. Not surprising. No growth spurt in stature. That's not surprising either. That growth spurt in uh, by like breadth 
has not been uh, identified in, in any other primate species to our knowledge, but it's also one that's not really studied very often. There aren't those data. And um, basically the, the extent of the, of the findings at this point are, are simply that the human adolescent period and growth spurts appear to be more systemic and that they involve growth in all dimensions, which is why we're seeing spurts in stature, bile like breath, everything basically, as opposed to other primate species where we see it in, in mass, not so much in um, the lengths uh, or other dimensions of things. So that was my rush through uh, through bonobos there, um, and I apologize for for despite all I cut, still taking a long time because I guess that's the hominin paleontologist. We always that's right. take too don't, long. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, okay, so if you could stop sharing your screen. Um, Chris, we will, there we go. Okay. Well, that was uh, yet another amazing talk. I mean, you know, what's interesting, Chris, is that it just seems so random to me. These guys are spelunking and they come across this huge find. It's just, you know, I mean, and it's really this little teeny, it's just amazing. Just amazing to me. Yeah, other than the fact that they were doing it in one of the areas that has more hominin fossils than anywhere else. It was random. They, they, that night, they did not expect to find anything. Yeah. That's part of the reason why they're, uh, oops, I shared again, evidently. No, 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 we're good. Um, that's one of the reasons why they, uh, they didn't uh, have enough battery in their camera. Um, they ran out without taking more than a single photo. Wow. Just amazing. Just amazing. Um, questions, anybody? Everybody's all overwhelmed. Um, any, any info at all from the Nobo joint articular surface area relevant to? Oh, here's some. Um, so I don't. I, I was I was mumbling one question to myself from uh, Betsy Lawler uh, asking about the uh -huh. Nobo joint articular surface area relative to Homo naledi. Hi. Um, Kara, can you turn yours down just a little bit? I'm getting a lot of feedback. Christopher, is um, that making sense, that question? It, it is. Okay. Um, so uh, not we. I could not actually use the data that I shared for that purpose because we don't have anything in the way of, you know, CT, X-ray, radiographs, anything like that to, to get the, surf, the joint surface area. But I do have um, an genetic sample of bonobos uh, from, um, from Belgium and bonobos are more like uh, Homo naledi in that respect than any, other, um, than any other great ape. So they are that gracile overall um, um, morphology does extend to the long bone, but still, um, Naledi is is way off the charts. They're they're so tiny that it seems like they would snap. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And then we've got another one from Wendy here. Were any particular injuries noted on the fossils discovered deep in the caves, such as dragged in by animals or something like that? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Yeah, there are a lot of a lot of um, the fossil sites in the area um, are the result of carnivore accumulation. Um, and in the case of Sediba, I'm not dancing around the question, I'll get to the question, but in the case of Sediba, there's a, an evidence of fractures that are consistent with bracing uh, for a fall, which is why um, you know, there's um, some evidence that they may have fallen down in the case of um, the specimens from Malapa. Uh, for the Naledi material, there's no evidence of carnivore activity whatsoever. Um, there, and that's true for, for all of the fossils that have been found since as well. Um, there's no tool marks, human tooth marks, anything like that that would suggest that the humans butchered them. Um, no evidence of, um, there's some evidence of falls and breakage while deceased, but not while living. Um, lots of breakage since then. Um, it's thought that at least some of them were trampled by cavers who had been in there before but not mapped it. 
Um, but in terms of, of getting them in the chamber, um, the, uh, the initial publication addressing that um, proposed that they were deliberately disposed of there, not because there was any evidence of that, but only because the other hypotheses that they could come up with and actually test um, could be disproven. So it was a process of elimination, but you know, the, what's the saying? The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence or? Yeah. What, so, so what, what do you think of, you know, I know when you talked about the, the East African cradle of mankind, <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, tectonic activity there. Uh, at, and in South Africa, they've got a, they've had a lot of issues in, in terms of you know flooding times and non-flooding times and the coastline being extended and then you know being flooded again. Could they have been up a little higher and then because of these changes uh, in uh, weather patterns and uh, that might have then made the caves go lower so that they may not have been so deep? I mean, is, am I making sense of my? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, at least with those, those Dinaletti fossils, there's, there is some evidence that the, the, the chamber has been flooded, that water has gotten in there, but there's, there's no evidence, which is, is usually pretty easy to see, that the, bone, the fossils' bones at any point have been washed any long distance, like from somewhere else. And also, usually when you, when you do see events or evidence of that, um, where say the remains are washed in from somewhere further out of the cave system, it's washing in all sorts of stuff, debris of other animals and, and whatnot, um, because animal remains are, are very common in a lot of these fossil sites. Mm -hmm. So you don't, it's, it wouldn't selectively wash in just hominin remains. Um, there are another site, um, the 102 site, the Dean you know, is 101, the 102 site's called Lissetti. Um, there are some uh, one of the skeletons was seemingly perhaps placed into a little um, crevice shelf kind of in the, in the wall of, um, of that part of the cave. But um, it also could have just washed in there if the, if the chamber did fill up and then the water drains out the sides, it would produce the same sort of thing. So there's some evidence of what you said, I think, but not to the extent that it would drastically change um, the way that we think at least some of those fossils. And I keep saying fossil, but they're actually not fully fossilized either. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not fossils. Yeah. Wow. I can't believe they found so many individuals too. I mean, that's really, really high. Um, yeah. 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 Now we just need to, we don't, but we only have a few individuals where we have known associations. That does make one thing difficult. We know that we have this many individuals, but because of so many of them are the same, because of lack of morphological variation, we can't definitively say that you know this femur goes with you know this humerus and in some instances. Some things were found in articulation, so mm -hmm. it's not that case across. And with Lissetti, we actually have a, a, a partial skeleton, but for the majority of stuff, it's, it's just that it's isolated remains. We could say that the femur looks like this, but not. How an individual is put together in any large numbers. Right. Wow. Well, a lot of work still to be done, clearly. Um, yes, yeah, so if there's anyone who wants to do it, they're actually accepting applications still. Really? Are they students? Really? Yes. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, except, except for right now, I think South Africa is still closed off. Yeah, they, they're still they, closed off. In a few months at least, but after that. Okay, well, some great opportunities there, guys, for all you budding primatologists, uh, paleo, uh, anthropologists, whatever, uh, to go out there and, uh, and get some work done. That's fabulous. Um, well, okay, well, thank you, everybody. I just want to mention just one thing um, that, uh, you know, Gary does lead uh, uh, tours into Borneo, so he's put a link there. So if any of you are interested, please uh, find that link. Um, I want to also just thank everybody for coming. Thank you to all our speakers. Those were just fantastic, fantastic talks. Yes, thank you everybody. Uh, it was really so interesting. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I learned a lot and that's always fun. Um, so thank you all. Um, thank you all of you for just attending. And I hope that um, you will uh, continue to uh, 
stay connected to the uh, either the APES group or the uh, Southern California Primate Research Forum. I just want to say a little bit about um, uh, Norm Rosen, who started the uh, the forums. He passed away uh, about just about a year ago now, and so I don't know if any if everybody knew that or not, uh, but. Uh, but we're trying to keep them going. Similar to you, Gabriella, we want to keep the, the history alive of the, of, of the people who came before us. Um, so we're going to try to keep the uh, forums going uh, as well. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining uh, and for staying with us this morning. I know we're coming from different time zones so that it was a challenge for some of you. So thank you for uh, joining us. And everybody stay well, stay safe, get vaccinated when you can. I've already had my two. So, um, so that before we start traveling to our various field sites and various locations that we work in, uh, let's hope that uh, Hopefully by 2022, we'll be able to move a little bit more freely planet-wide rather than just, you know, um, uh, countrywide. So, uh, yes, we are posting the recording. We will get that information out to you as soon as we uh, have that uh, and let everybody know where the recording uh, can be found and you can uh, use that uh, uh, to review or whatever. Um, all right, then. Goodbye, stay safe, wear a mask, double mask if you can, and um, let's stay healthy. All right, bye everybody, thank you so much. Thank you speakers. Thank you and Eric and everyone else who organized. Yes, thank you Eric. Thank you.